and cannot be with us today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing for the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. We are now formally in session. This summer will mark the 50th anniversary of the uprising of the Stonewall Inn, which sparked the modern LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer civil rights movement. And for the first time in its 20-year history, World Pride will be held in the United States simultaneously with Stonewall 50. Today, this committee is interested in learning more about current plans for Stonewall 50 and World Pride events in general, and beyond next summer celebration, as well as efforts the arts and cultural com communities are creating surrounding Stonewall 50's significance. In the 1950s and 60s, the LGBTQ community in New York City experienced widespread discrimination and an anti-gay legal system. New York State Liquor Authority penalized and shut down establishments that served alcohol to known or suspected LGBTQ individuals on the grounds that the gathering of LGBTQ individuals was considered disorderly. The police had the authority to arrest people for wearing less than three, three gender appropriate articles of clo clothing and so called gay behavior such as holding hands, kissing or dancing with someone of the same sex remained illegal in New York City. On June 28, 1969, New York police raided the Stonewall Inn, which was then known as a gay club located in Manhattan's Greenwich Village to ensure that the three-piece clothing law was being adhered to. Thirteen people were arrested, but as police hauled employees and patrons out of the bar in the early hours of the morning. According to historian David Carter, one woman being arrested yelled to bystanders, hey, why don't you guys do something? And they did. The police officers quickly lost control of the situation and tensions between city police and LGBTQ residents of the village erupted into protests, with many of those pr present being young members of the LGBTQ community, leading to six days of violent clashes and protests. Taking place on the streets around the Stonewall Inn, outside the bar on Christopher Street, in neighboring streets and in nearby Christopher Park. Within several weeks, village residents had organized into activist groups to concentrate efforts on establishing places for G LGBTQ individuals be, to be open about their sexual orientation without fear of being arrested. Within six weeks, two major gay activist organizations were also formed in New York City concentrating on confrontational tactics, and at least three newspapers were established to promote LGBTQ rights. The, event, the events now known collectively as the Stonewall Uprising shifted not only the fight for social and legal, legal equal rights for all sexualities, but led to a shift in our national psyche a legacy for intergenerational groups of advocates seeking equity, and launched the tradition of pride marches that many LBGTQ groups still participate in today. On June 28, 1970, the first gay pride marches took place in New York City, Los Angeles, 
San Francisco and Chicago to commemorate the first anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. And within a few years of the uprising, num numerous additional LGBTQ rights organizations were founded across the United States and the world. On June 23rd, 2015, the Stonewall Inn became the first landmark in New York City to be recognized by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission on the basis of its stat status in LGBTQ history. And on June 24, 2016, the Stonewall National Monument was named the first LGBTQ monument in the United States. And this summer, we mark the significance of this important history, which is not only local history or history to our community, but truly a national and even international legacy. In addition to the Stonewall Uprising, Uprising's political and cultural influences, there are numerous ways in which the events took place in June of 1969 have influenced the artistic community in New York City, many of which have manifested in the decades since the Stonewall Uprising. We are so pleased to have so many of artists and cultural institutions with us here today and we look forward to speaking to all of them soon. I would like to acknowledge the members of the committee who are he here today. We're joined by Council Member Lori Cumbo. I know there are more downstairs, they'll be up. I would also like to thank my Chief of Staff to Jimmy Van Bramer, Matthew Wallace, my the legislative director to Jimmy Van Bramer, Jack Bernard-Nadovich, my committee finance analyst, Ilya Ali, our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, and our committee policy analyst, Christy Dwyer. And with that, I would like to call on our commissioner, Tom finkel Hello. Mm -hmm. Oh. Please raise your right hand, thank you. Yep. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, shall I commence with my testimony? Yes. Thank you. Okay, good morning or good afternoon, Chair Koslowitz and members of the committee. Councilwoman Lori Cumbo. Uh, I'm Tom Finkelpearl, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm here today to testify regards to today's topic, Arts, Culture, and Stonewall 50. This year marks a momentous occasion for all New Yorkers and especially for our LGBTQ community. Equal rights and free expression are core values for New York. They're what make our city a beacon for people across the world and what gives our neighbors and streets, our neighborhoods and streets, a sense of vibrancy and energy that you can't find anywhere else. And no small part of this is our identity, of no small part of our identity comes from our city's hard-won willingness to embrace our LGBTQ neighbors. I say hard-won because the events that uh, Chair Koslitz mentioned before, uh, we're speaking about today, Stonewall, was a stunning and inspiring display of courage by those who took part in it. That's something we should not forget as we mark the 50th year. Americans have a habit of viewing events from the past through rose-colored glasses, but we're committed to remembering that the Stonewall uprisings took place in response to oppression, this year, we celebrate how far we've come, thanks to the people who started this path. And with our partners in the cultural sector, we're also recognizing how far we have to go. Appropriately, these celebrations will not be limited to a week or a month. New York City and Company is making 2019 officially the year of pride. They are working to position NYC as the most LGBTQ friendly destination year round and to increase awareness of Stonewall 50th anniversary and its importance to New York's DNA. We share this commitment to both recognize the importance of the Stonewall anniversary and to celebrate and support our LGBTQ community year round. Earlier this month, we joined the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs in announcing a new cultural partners offering uh, IDNYC cardholders free memberships. 
In part, in honor to, of the anniversary of Stonewall, we're thrilled to welcome the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art to our list of partners. We also announced, as part of these new benefits, a third gender category for IDNYC cards, giving New Yorkers another way to more fully and accurately reflect their identity. Whether it's protest, activism, commemoration, or reflection, art has always been important for the LGBTQ community. As part of the Create NYC public engagement process, we hosted a public conversation at MoMA PS1, focusing on the LGBT community and the arts. We are honored to have Chair Van Bramer join us for this event. That conversation revealed an interest in archiving and preserving artifacts and materials related to LGBTQ culture and advocacy. In part due to these conversations, Create NYC Cultural Plan embraces supporting LGBTQ communities through culture. Some programs we've started or expanded including engaging homeless LGBTQ youth uh, through public artists in residency program with the Administration for Children's Services. Our work with the cultural sector to ensure a diverse and inclusive workforce also invest is also investigating LGBTQ representation in staffs and leadership of cultural organizations. We plan on hosting a follow-up Create NYC office hours ahead of Stonewall 50 in part to provide a space to share resources, coordinate planning, air concerns about how the commemorations are shaping up. At this meeting, we would also like to learn more about how we can collectively help make these events meaningful, successful, and impactful for groups that continue to face unique barriers, harassment, and discrimination, most notably LGBTQ communities of color and trans New Yorkers. DCLA is now, newly, a member of Stonewall 50 Consortium and the agency's LGBT community liaison, Anthony Meyer, who is sitting right here, has been participating in the consortium's meetings programs for more than a year. The consortium is a group, and the consortium is well represented here. Uh, you'll hear from them. A group of nonprofit organizations collaborating on and coordinating programming, exhibitions, materials for Stonewall Uprising and broader history of LGBTQ civil rights movement in New York City. Many of the consortium's members are DCLA-funded cultural nonprofits, such as Poets House, the Whitney Museum, and Dance NYC. I'll describe some of the activities DCLA funding groups, DCLA funded groups have planned in a moment. The Mayor's Community Affairs Unit and Citywide Events Coordination and the Management, uh, and Management Office are supporting a number of planned events by connecting organizations to relevant city agencies. This includes both regular annual celebrations as well as commemorations being planned specifically for the annual anniversary of Stonewall. The last thing we want is for the excitement and momentum to be interrupted by a hiccup with permitting. So we're thankful to the mayor's office, commitment to making sure individuals and organizations planning these events have support they need with respect to safety, security, crowd control, public transportation, sanitation, and other city services uh, that we can provide. The city's new Office of Nightlife is establishing a subcommittee of its interagency working group, of which DCLA is a member, uh, to address social justice issues in nightlife community, which includes LGBTQ issues. In its listening tour, held throughout the fall of 2018, which DCLA representative also attended, the Office of Nightlife uh, heard that uh, protecting spaces supporting the LGBTQ community is top priority. In a few recent instances, the Office of Nightlife has been contacted by LGBTQ establishments that were facing threats and harassment to help ensure that the city's response was handled sensitively and effectively. As you know, DCLA's primary function is as a funder of cultural organizations and programming. More than 100 cultural development fund grantees offer LGBTQ programming and or serve LGBTQ New Yorkers. And here are some examples. Arthur Aviles Typical Theater, also known as the Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, hosts an annual Out Like That Festival uh, this event celebrates performance work uh, by and for LGBTQ artists and audiences. Also, their Transvisionaries uh, program is a performance series featuring cabaret singers, poets, comics, musicians, dancers, and performers who identify as transgender and or gender nonconforming. It brings these performances to restaurants and cafes around the borough of the Bronx. Three, definitely. Uh, Brooklyn's Thelma Hill Performing Arts Center uh, has a historic focus on LGBTQ dance artists of color. The group's Peaks Works in Progress is a year-round program that prevents works by NYC-based LGBTQ and women of color choreographers, as well as dance companies of color. In Queens, the New York Lesbian and Gay Experimental Film Festival's 31st New York Queer Experimental Film Festival 
is happening at Dreamhouse Community Arts Center in Ridgewood, Queens next month. It will feature an immersive environment with films, videos, digital media, installations, and performances by LGBTQ artists from all over the world, selected by guest curators and a panel of local artists. The Tank in Manhattan has an annual Pride Fest that offers programming by LGBTQ artists exploring queer identities and sexuality. Programming has included a dance show featuring choreographer by Mark Nunez and a screening of the Trans Literary Project by Maybe Burke and Honest Accomplice Theater, a web series about trans and a web series about trans issues. And in Staten Island, the Alice Austin House was des designated as LGBT Historic Site in 2017 by the National Register of Historic Places. Members of the Cultural Institution Group also host a range of programs both honoring and specific um, anniversary and recognizing LGBTQ culture uh, year round. Two years ago, Brooklyn Children's Museum launched a partnership with Drag Queen Story Hour to highlight gender differences and fluidity, as well as advocacy and activism for young audiences. For anyone <clears throat> with young ones that may be interested, this unique partnership happens on the second Saturday of every month. Queen's Theatre, in partnership with the One Minute Play Festival, will produce a community action reading and town hall dialogue for 50 theatrical moments, one inspired by each year, generated by 50 LGBTQ playwrights in collaboration with the wider Queen's community. The work will explore topics of intersectionality, race, culture, non-English language narratives specific to the Queen's community, and locating contemporary queer issues within the shifting cultural landscape of, at this moment. At the Museum of the City of New York, a new case study on trans activism will open in April as part of the ongoing exhibition, Activist New York. Trans activism will focus on the central role that trans New Yorkers such as Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, and many others played during the Stonewall Uprising and through the formation of activist groups and direct service organizations in the 70s and beyond. On June 27th, the museum will also host the third annual LGBTQ Teen Summit, a free full day prideful experience for teens and youth. In July, El Museo de Barrio, in partnership with the Museum of the City of New York, will celebrate Stonewall 50 at the annual Uptown Bounce, a free community celebration featuring music, dance, gallery tours, kids activisms, and more. The Bronx Museum, a member of the Stonewall 50 Consortium, will host the exhibition, The Life and Times of Alvin Baltrop, opening in August. Bronx-born Baltrop, who died in 2004, was a self-taught photographer whose work focused on the dilapidated Hudson River piers, other cruising spots, and gay men and their subcultures during the 70s and the 80s, prior to the AIDS pandemic. This exhibition will feature Baltrop's photographs and his personal uh, archives, which are preserved at the Bronx Museum. On May 12th, the Pride Center in Staten Island will have their annual 5K fun run on the grounds of the Snug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden. The island-wide events culminate on Saturday, May 18th, when Snug Harbor will be the host site for the annual Pride Center of Staten Island's LGBTQ Pride Festival. We've been thrilled to hear how widely embraced this opportunity would be and how appropriately diverse the planned events are, from somber reflections on struggle and loss to the jubilant celebrations of our vibrant LGBTQ communities. I thank the chair and members of the committee for this opportunity to highlight the important work being done to recognize the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, as well as other initiatives to support this important community. I welcome any questions you may have. Um, I would ask, do you have any idea how many people will be attending? Uh, I don't have that estimate, but I was at a NYC and Company. I'm on the board of NYC and Company. And the, this was a major topic, and it has been a major topic for about the last year. And I think we could probably get the numbers from them. The numbers are enormous, that, that to have International Pride Festival here and Stonewall, the way it's been um, you know, promoted is great, and I think we'd have to get those numbers back. Uh, I think there might be some estimates, but the, the numbers I was hearing were quite large. Uh, are there any, uh, do they know how many people were here in the one in 25? I could find that out for you as well. But I think the thing is that this year, uh, the, the sort of the international pride, uh, this has been designated as the location, right? So in terms of that festival and having um, sort of a focal point around uh, what's gonna go on, especially in June, it's all year. Uh, 
I think it's going to be quite different from what happened at the 25th anniversary, which I don't know if it was such a, as much a big thing 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, it was, okay. Uh, so maybe we can get those numbers as well, yeah. Okay, and oh, maybe this, whoever that was could testify later and answer the question. Um, I'm, I can get back to you with the numbers that I've been hearing, but I can't quote them uh, myself, yeah. Okay, thank you. And who else is um, interacting with you on this whole, you know, project? Um, I mean, so essentially, look, we're a funding organization, so I'm talking, so we've given lots of, you know, uh, many of the organizations that we fund we're participating in the consortium. We're interacting with NYC and company, and we will do another of the um, town hall. So we're using our convening um, you know, power uh, to have a meeting. We're working with other city agencies, um, but for the most part, again, we are a funding agency, and that's the biggest thing we're doing, is funding through the cultural organizations that we fund. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Drum. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Tom, I'm sorry, I'm Commissioner, I'm sorry that uh, I was late. I had a vote in another committee across the uh, way on 250, um, and, and I didn't hear all of your testimony. Mm -hmm. and I don't seem to have it here. Did okay. you talk about anything that's happening in the, uh, in the outer boroughs? Yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we talked about what's going on at Queens Theater. We got in Staten Island. I see we have our uh, Staten Island rep here. Um, Absolutely, what's happening in the Bronx as well. This It's really citywide, absolutely not just focused on Manhattan, although there's great stuff happening in this borough as well. And do you, do you know what month those things are happening in? Is it May yeah. through June? I mean, a lot of stuff's happening in June, obviously, but it's a whole year thing. I mean, I think that the Whitney Museum said that they were conscious of the Andy Warhol show being scheduled for this year uh, uh, as a way, in a way to kick things off right now. The Warhol show's already up. Um, so, and a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of the show, if you go to the Warhol show, really is about the context of the late 60s. And one of the things that I'm always interested in is highlighting the local history. As a matter of fact, the uh, LaGuardia um, archives, the Wagner archives, did an exhibit at Queens Museum. Yes, a lot of my there. material was there. Yes. Um, but do you know if uh, these um, programs uh, that are going to be in the outer boroughs uh, focus on the local? activism that occurred since Stonewall? Because uh, oftentimes it's very Manhattan focused. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I mean, what I, again, I've been sort of reviewing what's going on, I've gone to some meetings. A lot of what uh, is being planned uh, in, the, in the not outer boroughs, the other boroughs aside from Manhattan, really I think is focusing a lot on, on the progress that's been made and what's happened recently. What you're talking about in terms of the history of the activism in other boroughs, which was a unique event. I mean, I was there and I saw that was a very unusual uh, situation, but I think we're going to have some of the organizers of Stonewall 50 here, and there's been a lot of interest in, in the whole idea of the question of the archive and how inclusive the archives are. So I think other people might be able to answer that question. A lot of the stuff that I just listed in my testimony, which we're happy to <laughs> provide with you, uh, act is around uh, what's happening today, but not necessarily what's happened, let's say, in the 80s and the 90s, like that intermediate period. What happened at Stonewall happened here in the village. What happened after happened everywhere. I think that's extremely important. And are you this. working to ensure that communities of color are represented in um, the exhibitions and, um, and the planning? So we're, you know, again, we're not doing the shows, mm -hmm. but we are, con we're gonna do another <laughs> convening. We did a convening actually in Queens. Um, and we're gonna do another in, in anticipation. A lot of this stuff is being planned actually for this summer, right, because that's the, um, so we're gonna be doing competing so people can compare notes now. And we did say in the testimony that it's important to us that that be inclusive of, a, of the city and including specifically calling out that, or um, the organizations currently in a way uh, that we have to focus attention, additional attention to, not that any of the organizations that, that everything is perfect, are organizations of color and trans. That's what we call that in the testimony. Does uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs um, work uh, with uh, Landmarks Preservation or other organizations in terms of um, the historicalization of um, 
cultural sites, et cetera, uh, with the LGBT community. A lot of the uh, sites that um, where original stuff happened, um, as you probably know, has now been converted to other uses. And um, you know, we're working with um, Andrew Berman and others to uh, try to make sure that our history is not erased. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if your department plays any role in or assist in that effort at all. So, not I mean, not officially. So we're not. I'm not. I don't sit on the Landmarks Commission or anything like that. But it's obviously something important to the administration, and we support that. Okay. Good. All right, thank you. Okay, we've also been joined by Council Member Moya. Thank you very much. Thank you. Testimony. Uh, I'm good? Yes, you're Okay, good. thank you. You've always been good. <laughs> and Council Member Varelli, I don't know if I mentioned that. Danny. Okay. Now we're going to have a treat. I'd like to call on Jack Ferver to perform for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm briefly going to give some testimony and then a very brief performance from a recent piece I just had called Everything's Imaginable, which was at New York Live Arts. It was a work where I interviewed four queer performers about their childhood icons. I built solos for them about that, and you'll hear a little bit about what my process is in this testimony before I perform. The queer is not only told they are natural, but that they have chosen to be so. It is a particular kind of hatred and annihilation that the queer receives with this one-two punch. The result of this shattering trauma creates a slipperiness of self, this fragmentation, this relentless brokenness that continually seeks stability and fails is very much inside my work. My performers and I drop and shift into various roles or at times are holding numerous roles all at once. Selves and psyches shift, collapse, and return as something else inside my performances. I find this state of ever-changing performativity more truthful to life than characters that remain a blunt object of their creator. In our current cultural climate, I feel it is more important to expose the shattered qualities of the psyche resulting from violence, along with a wildness and abandon found in play. Play becomes a political act when performed in an environment of hatred and disdain. Certainly pride is iconic in this act. I also want to say that every day I recognize my existence as an artist and a queer person in the long shadow of the AIDS crisis. That during the AIDS crisis, we were also hit with the NEA4, the resulting, restructure, the resulting restructuring of the NEA, and that funding and support ripple effect on both the right and left side is not lost on me. Many artists in my generation regard themselves as parentless children, the children of murdered parents. There is a canyon, an emptiness, nothing can fill it. To be a parentless child can mean many things. For myself, it means trying to be something I didn't have, which is a foundational base of my teaching and art practice. It also means to live with and to make from that haunted loneliness. This performance goes to the floor, and I'm going to change the whole thing so I'm standing, because we're not on a rake. So it'll give me some, you know, chance, as we say in choreography. <laughs> I don't know where I am. I'm at my friend's house upstate. She's out of the country and letting me use her house so I can finish writing this book. The news is on. I'm on the phone with my boyfriend when suddenly I can't see. I turn around but nothing. Totally dark, completely black. I sink to the floor. I whisper something to him. He says he can't understand me and ask me to repeat what I've said. I choke out too many voices. I hang up. I'm crawling on the floor. The carpet feels familiar. I wonder if I'm at my parents' house. The walls are breathing. They're moving in on me like when I'd get a fever as a child and I'd call out for my mother, but my voice comes back louder and at a higher pitch. It gives me a feeling of vertigo and I throw up. No. No, I'm not at my parents' house. My parents are dead. I'm at my friend's house upstate. It's so quiet in the house, but I think I hear a car pulling into the driveway. I wonder if it's her. No, 
It can't be her because she's out of the country. My head is at the landing of the stairs. My bedroom is up there. I don't want to go up there. I hear a man scream at the top of the stairs and I run to the basement to tell my parents about it. I throw up again. I black out. When I wake up, I still can't see, and then I realize it's just that it's night, and it gets so dark in the country. I feel like there's someone in the house with me. I should just get in my car and drive back to the city. I, I try to stand, but my stomach doesn't feel right, so I stay down. It feels like I'm not breathing. I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on standing up. I'm gonna focus on moving slow. When I stand up, I knock a piece of the wall off. The carpet dulls the sound to a thud. A hand will reach through that hole and grab me. I take a step away. My foot pinches sharply. I lean down and pick a piece of glass out of the sole of my foot. What was I doing? I knocked a mirror off the wall and then I stepped on it. Why didn't I turn the lights on? Why was I scaring myself in the dark? Because it felt good. It felt familiar. It felt correct for the situation. I'll be the disease. I'm thinking about disease while I listen to the sound of the wind in the trees. From my childhood bedroom, I could see through a clearing in the trees to the highway. In the moments I would see a car appear and disappear, I would think about how one day it'd be me getting out of there. In the silence and in the dark, I can remember everything. I remember this boy in high school and he grabbed me and slammed me into a locker and there was a jagged piece of metal that stuck out of the locker and it cut through my shirt and into my skin, cutting me open while he said, I'm gonna kill you, faggot. His spit going all over my face and into my mouth while he used me like it wasn't my body or it was my body and I was just so small inside of it or I was just so far outside of it. Like, I'm in the third grade and we're on this boat trip in Alaska and they tell me if I fall in, I'll die immediately of hypothermia. And it feels so good to have something be so accurate. And there's this little otter that swims by the side of the boat. And he's so cute, and I toss him shrimp every day. And then the next summer, I watch as the Exxon spill happens there, and all of these animals choke and die because men are evil, just like him using my body and cutting me open. And I'm looking into his face, so I never forget it. And I never forget it. And I never forget anything. It's so crazy because that boy, he ended up moving to New York too. He's a critic. At first when I saw his name, I thought, no, it can't be him. But then I saw a photo of him and it is. Same smirk. He comes to all my shows and each review gets increasingly homophobic, annihilating. He's trying to get rid of me. He's trying to get rid of me by getting rid of my work. Have you ever eaten at Japanica? I love it there. I was eating there with my best friend and I saw him come in and I thought, all right, enough is enough. I'm gonna confront him. And as I went over to his table, he picked up his tea and threw it into my face and slammed me into the windows that face University Avenue. My friend ran over to me and said, are you okay, who was that guy? As a child, he got sick all the time. It was a good way to avoid getting beaten up at school. As an adult, he still gets sick all the time or injured, so he doesn't have to see anybody, not even his friends. His friends grow tired of this and stop trying to see him, stop calling, stop texting. It feels relieving, but also a sense of tension. He has to wonder what kind of friend was he being. He'd become so isolated. He goes to pick up the phone, but this butterfly or leaden feeling comes over him and he puts the phone back down. He doesn't know how to talk to his friends about it. After all, he doesn't know how to talk to himself about it. He can't put it together. Thank you so much. I have to step out for a little while. I have a meeting downstairs, 
and uh, Councilmember Borelli is going to take my place. Thank you. Uh, we're going to call our next panel of four individuals. Forgive me if I butcher your names. Uh, Eric Marcus, Jason Bauman, Chris Frederick, and Adam Odessa Rubin, and Adam Ashraf. Thank you all. Uh, thank you folks for coming. Bet you didn't think a Republican was gonna chair this hearing, huh? <laughs> um, if there's no order, should we start perhaps from the end? Would that be okay? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Adam Odsess Rubin, and I'm the founder and artistic director of National Queer Theater, a new nonprofit theater company based in New York City. Thank you for having us here to talk about our plans this summer. For World Pride and Stonewall 50 this year, we're producing the Criminal Queerness Festival in June, showcasing four plays from international LGBTQ writers whose gender and sexuality are criminalized in their home countries. We're already working with playwrights from Pakistan, Tanzania, China, and Egypt to build the festival, which will involve over 80 artists and 1,000 audience members from throughout the city and around the world. IRT Theater on Christopher Street is hosting us for our four-week residency to support this work, which will include special advocacy panels to help audiences take these stories outside the walls of the theater and fight for the rights of our community abroad. We will be presenting on using theater for global advocacy at World Pride's Human Rights Conference, and we are working with the UN and Outright International, as well as LGBT organizations abroad, to magnify the impact of these plays. Um, good afternoon. My name is Adam Ashraf El Sayeg, and I'm one of the playwrights and producers part of the Criminal Queerness Festival. In 2019, it is illegal to be gay in 71 countries, and six countries still carry the death penalty for queer people. We can't produce our art in our own countries because of censorship and fear of arrest. And yet there is hope. India decriminalized homosexuality last year, which freed millions of queer Indians from persecution. We are using our skills as artists to empower our communities worldwide. Throughout LGBT history, there has been a connection between progressive social movements and gay performance that questioned the status quo and pushed for change, such as Angels in America, The Laramie Project, and The Normal Heart. Both, and theater and both in theater and activist circles, however, queer issues are seldom addressed outside of a US or Western context. Being an Egyptian playwright who spent the majority of my life in the Middle East, I'm an artist who's had extreme difficulty producing my work. Similarly, I've encountered many queer artists in Egypt, Abu Dhabi, India, and London, uh, Lebanon, not London, <laughs> who have had their work and their collaborators and their own livelihoods threatened. This ranged from performance groups participating in Beirut Pride being taken over by the Lebanese police to the Pakistani Censorship Bureau monitoring, monitoring one of our artists' plays while they were being performed in Pakistan. After meeting National Queer Theater and learning of their work and mission and collaborating with Adam on multiple projects, we created the Criminal Queerness Festival to showcase, to showcase these stories from regions where queerness is criminalized. This first year of the festival will tell stories from Pakistan, Egypt, Kenya, and China. This festival is unique in that it majorly benefits artists like myself who are typically disenfranchised and not given opportunities to share our craft or our stories. Um, this summer, for example, I tried to present my work to the community in Egypt and the only way to do that was in someone's apartment and promoting it through word of mouth because if it had gone out to the wrong person, everybody in the room could have been arrested. Here in the US, I'm able to do my work in a way that I would not be able to do in my home country. 
this should have a ripple effect and open up ab avenues for more queer artists looking to share stories in the region and abroad. More importantly, the festival will be incredibly meaningful for queer and straight audiences alike who can learn about the queer communities from across the world and learn how they can make positive changes in these communities. The same way plays like Angels in America changed the way we understand particular moments in queer history today, the Criminal Queerness Festival launching these, place, these plays could be an inciter of many opportunities to come for US audiences to engage with a new understanding of how queer issues emerged in different communities and how we can be begin to have that conversation internationally. We at National Queer Theater believe that storytelling has the power to create real social change in the streets and in the hearts and minds of those willing to listen. Our mission is to foster and support LGBTQ communities through social justice in the performing arts. In our first six months, we've raised $30,000 with the help of Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Today, I wanna to invite you to help bring our artists' work to New York City for World Pride and Stonewall 50. For the Criminal Queerness Festival, we are seeking an additional $50,000 in funding, and we're looking for producers and sponsors to help us share these stories of global queer pride and resistance. We're not eligible for DCLA funding, but if there are any avenues through which the council can support the Criminal Queerness Festival and our artists, we welcome your support. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I know you have to leave early, if, if I'm correct. We're okay. Okay. Um, by the way, since, uh, since this, uh, this morning, I just saw a, a BBC story that uh, there was an arrest f of a journalist for interviewing a, a gay man. I don't know if you guys saw that, this morning's news. Um, but we'll continue with the panel. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, my name is Chris Frederick. Uh, I'm the managing director of NYC Pride, Heritage of Pride. Uh, NYC Pride, Heritage of Pride is the organizer tasked to create World Pride in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. We'll be creating over 25 events that speak to a wide array of individuals within the LGBTQIA community, including but not limited to the NYC Pride March, Stonewall 50 commemoration rally, Pride Fest, opening ceremony, closing ceremony, and Pride Island. Additionally, we uh, wanted to specifically speak to one initiative that we are working on for Stonewall 50 World Pride related to the arts community. NYC Pride is committed to putting LGBTQIA plus artists to, uh, in the forefront uh, in 2019. We are happy to announce that we have secured funding to execute a massive mural project for World Pride. The World Pride mural project will consist of a minimum of 50 murals in all five boroughs. The project will consist of mur murals, sculptures, pop art, beautification projects, and more. And NYC Pride cannot do this alone. The first step is executing a project of this magnitude is securing a project manager. We've been, we've been in talks with uh, a local art collective to take on this responsibility, and we're happy to re report that the contract is 90% signed. The art collective will be working with other art-based organizations, city agencies, and community leaders to execute this project uh, in full by June 17, 2019. The production process will consist of the following, securing the artists both locally inter and internationally, securing insurance, uh, securing walls, uh, art mock-ups and approvals, securing supplies, production on walls, video, photo, content during the process, NYC Pride announcements, walking map production, uh, and a launch party event. NYC Pride will be working closely with the art collective uh, to ensure the success of all art, uh, uh, to ensure the success of all, all artwork. All artists' walls mock-ups will be approved by NYC Pride and we will ensure that all artists are LGBTQIA plus and or allies of the community. The project will ultimately give these artists a larger platform during one of the most important years for the community and provide an artistic point of view that will touch on numerous relevant topics. We are confident that the World Pride Mural Project will be an amazing addition to our core events, uh, such as, like I mentioned, the March, Pride Fest, and Pride Island. NYC Pride is producing 25 events and initiatives to commemorate World Pride Stonewall 50 in June. To learn more uh, the official events, uh, visit www.stonewall50.org. Thank you. Next. 
Good afternoon. I'm Jason Bauman, Assistant Director for Collection Development and the Coordinator of LGBT, the LGBT Initiative at the New York Public Library. I would like to thank Chair Jimmy Van Bramer and Council Member Borelli and the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee for holding this hearing. I would also like to thank the entire City Council for the sustained support of libraries. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on NYPL's world-renowned LGBTQ collections. The 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots this year is an essential opportunity for the LGBTQ community to reflect on our accomplishments and the many new challenges we currently face. Libraries and museums play an essential role in preserving and transmitting cultural memory, which are what make that reflection possible. The New York Public Library has one of the most important collections of LGBTQ history in, in, New, York, in New York and in the United States. The library has the archives of pivotal activist organizations, including the Mattachine Society of New York, Gay Activists Alliance, Gay Men of African Descent, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and ACT UP, as well as the papers of LGBTQ activists and artists, such as Barbara Giddings, James Baldwin, William Burroughs, Alberta Hunter, and Virginia Woolf, to name a few. In order to provide the LGBTQ and larger communities deeper access to this cultural heritage during the anniversary of Stonewall, the library will be holding an exhibition, Love and Resistance, Stonewall 50, opening February 14th and running through July 14th. The exhibition will is illustrate the cultural impact of Stonewall in LGBTQ protest, nightlife, publishing, and relationships. The exhibition will feature the photographs of pioneering photojournalist Kay Tobin Lahusen and Diana Davies, who will also be featured in a companion volume that we are publishing with W.W. Norton. We will also be publishing an anthology from our archives, The Stonewall Reader, with Penguin Classics. In addition, we will be holding public programs across Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island relating to LGBTQ history of New York City neighborhoods, building on the success of our partnership with the New York City Trans Oral History Archive. This will include programs for young adults and children. Uh, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall is a pivotal opportunity for LGBTQ communities to reflect on our past and imagine our future. Libraries and museums are essential to that process. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and the entire council for unwavering support of libraries and the opportunity to testify today about such an important upcoming moment in New York City. Thanks. Thank you. And finally? Just a quick question. The clock that says three minutes, what happens when I run over? No, no uh, we'll be starting that next panel, I think. You have uh, as much time as you like. That saves me from crossing out half of what I've written. But it's not long, I promise. It's maybe five minutes. Um, I'm Eric Marcus, creator and host of the Making Gay History podcast and board member on the planning committee for the American LGBTQ Plus Museum. But I'm here today principally in my role as chair of the Stonewall 50 Consortium. Thank you, Councilman, uh, Council Member Van, uh, Van Bramer, for your leadership, for organizing this oversight hearing, uh, Council Member Borelli for leading it, um, and for inviting me to testify today. And thank you to the Council staff, including Jack Ber uh, Bernadovich, Christy Dwyer, and Brenda McKinney. My first time in this chamber was in the early 1980s for the Gay Rights Bill hearings, and I remember sitting up in that balcony um, and getting into an argument with religious fundamentalists sitting behind me who tried shouting down anyone testifying in favor of the gay rights bill's passage. Back then, I could never have imagined that I'd be sitting here today in my current role representing nearly 200 cultural and educational institutions planning programming, exhibitions, and educational materials for the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. And having been invited here to testify by an out and proud city council member who isn't the only out and proud city council member. I want to acknowledge one of my heroes on the council, uh, council member Danny Drum. I'd say it was a dream come true today, uh, but back in the early 1980s, my imagination wasn't nearly that good. Down to business. So I'm the founder and volunteer chair of the Stonewall 50 Consortium, a nonprofit organization that brings together nearly 200 nonprofit institutions and organizations committed to producing programming, exhibitions, and educational materials related to the Stonewall Uprising and or the history of the LGBTQ civil rights movement in the context of the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. I've included a complete list of our members as part of my written testimony. The mission of the consortium includes helping participating institutions and organizations share ideas and best practices, facilitate potential collaborations, coordinate outreach efforts, and avoid scheduling conflicts and duplication of programming. We're funded by grants from the New York Community Trust and the Calamus Foundation. 
The grants made it possible to hire our part-time vice chair, Inga Detaya, who's in the front row, to, who oversees much of the work we do. We also have support from the National Parks Conservation Association, which generously offered us office space, and the New York Public Library, which hosts our every other month meetings. One of the most joyous aspects of this work has been watching representatives of, a mem of our members at those meetings. I'm sorry, uh, right, you host our monthly meetings. One of the most joyous aspects of this work has been watching representatives of our members at those meetings get to know each other, share ideas, support one another, and collaborate. Many of those who attend are members of the LGBTQ communities, and many are allies, and all are committed to creating work that highlights, celebrates, and commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising and or some aspect of the history of the LGBTQ civil rights movement. The founding of the consortium was something of an accident. It started two years ago as a conference call in the fall of 2016 that I organized between my colleagues at the National Park Service and council member Danny Drum, who was then chair of the council's education committee. My colleagues at the National Park Service were in the early stages of working on materials for the new Stonewall National Monument, and I was in discussions with council member Drum about creating LGBTQ inclusive American history curricula anchored by the archival audio from my three decade old oral history archive from which the Making Gay History podcast is drawn. I thought council member Drum and my colleagues at NPS would be interested in having a conversation. That five-way conference call led to a first public meeting hosted by Dr. Jason Bauman, who's sitting next to me, at the New York Public Library. We had about 20 people at that first meeting, and we've grown from there and grown and grown. As volunteer chair of the Stonewall 50 Consortium, my focus has been on providing support to our members. We do this in a number of ways. First, through our every other month meetings where members get to briefly present information about their upcoming programs. And at every meeting, we have a special guest who helps inform our members about some aspect of the Stonewall Uprising, the history of the LGBTQ civil rights movement, or Stonewall 50 plans. For example, at next, at next week's meeting, I'll be leading a conversation with Stacey Lentz, LGBTQ activist, co-owner of the Stonewall Inn, and CEO and co-founder of the Stonewall Inn Gives Back Initiative. Second, on our website's member-only pages, we provide a list of resources, including services and information that members are offering to provide one another, ideas for how to characterize the Stonewall Uprising, which was not the start of the gay civil rights movement, sorry to correct the council member, and a calendar of member events. Until now, the calendar of member events has been on a hidden page of the website. But as I've come to discover in the past couple of weeks, the Stonewall 50 Consortium has the most comprehensive listing of Stonewall 50 events. Some of those events have already taken place, and the number of events will dramatically increase in number in the coming months. Just as an example, New York University alone has 40 different programs and events in the works. The original purpose of the calendar was to help our members avoid stepping on each other's toes as they schedule their events. For example, the New York City Opera, which is premiering a new opera called Stonewall, coordinated with the New York City Gay Men's Chorus, which has commissioned a new work with the Gay Men's Chorus of Los Angeles to avoid having their premieres on the same night. When we first created the calendar, we had no plans to make it publicly available. But we now find we're getting press inquiries and inquiries from the general public about what's being planned for Stonewall 50 throughout New York City, and we have found that the best resource for that information is the Stonewall 50 Consortium Calendar. So as of February 1, we'll be making our, public, our, our calendar public, so anyone visiting the Stonewall 50 Consortium website can access it. Here's where I welcome the Council's advice and support. While our calendar is functional and relatively comprehensive, it was never meant for general public use, so it's not the prettiest thing. While I'm very proud of what we've created, and that's principally thanks to our cha Vice Chair, Inga Detaya, we'd welcome both the advice and support of the Council on what we can do to transform our functional website calendar into something that presents the best face possible for the City of New York as we prepare to welcome the world for Stonewall 50 and World Pride. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to, tes to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. And I failed to do something at the beginning of the panel. If you wouldn't mind all just stating your name for the record. Start from this end. Yes, um, Eric Marcus. Jason Bauman. Chris Frederick. Adam Odsess Rubin. Adam Ashraf El Saig. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first for Eric. 
Uh, about the calendar, I know you said it wasn't pretty. Hopefully, the focus is on the artwork and the performances. You know, the calendar we could we could suffer through. Um, but who actually manages the calendar and who resolves the the, the conflicts of interest, uh, conflicts of events? I just tell everyone what to do when they listen. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, in terms of, con there will be so many conflicts. If you look at the calendar already for June, um, there are multiple events every day. So it's up to the members to work things out. So the, the New York City Opera and the Gay Men's Chorus of New York um, are not going to have events, have their premiere on the same day. Um, the Stonewall 50 Consortium, uh, that's, that's me and Inga Dataya, um, and principally Inga maintains the, uh, the calendar. So all of our members are submitting information about their events to us and then that information is posted on the website. And, and you're working with NYC and Co. on, on this to some degree? Um, well, NYC and, and company knows what we're doing. Um, they are listing some of the events. Um, so, I mean, it really was just in the last couple of weeks we discovered that their calendar is selective. Um, and it's not listing one-off events. And many of our members are smaller organizations from around the city, uh, from the outer boroughs, and I hail from Queens, which, is, which I'm very proud of. Um, so we are listing every single, every single event of our member organizations. And as I said, we have nearly 200 organizations. Um, can, can you just talk uh, in your own uh, historic opinion how uh, planning for Stonewall 50 has been different from Stonewall 25? <laughs> <laughs> there were, there, the biggest event for Stonewall 25 was at the New York Public Library. It was an extraordinary exhibition. There, were, there was an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York. Um, it was a different world 25 years ago. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, the big banners on the outside of the New York Public Library did not have the word gay um, in them. In fact, my book, Making Gay History, which was published in 1992, uh, was published under the name Making History because the publisher, Harper Collins, was nervous about using the word gay. So I, the whole thing has shocked me. I can't believe the level of interest, the level of comfort among our members with these issues. Um, many of the people who attend our meetings are not LGBTQ. And I, it shouldn't shock me that we have allies who really don't care whether or not someone is gay. They're just passionate about the, the work. So I, I don't think it's possible to compare what's happening this year to 25 years ago. Um, it's such an embarrassment of riches in terms of, of the interest um, in the arts and cultural and educational communities in this event um, and in terms of uh, interest of people who are going to be coming here. One of the reasons we've decided to make the, the calendar public is people have contacted us from outside the U.S. who want to know what's going on in May, June, July, um, and they need time to plan. So it won't be enough to have these events posted two months from now. They have to be up and ready now. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Drum. Thank you, uh, Chair Varelli. Um, it's great to see all of you here, and it's great to hear all of the plans that are going on. Um, I just wanted to relate something with Adam as well. Um, from uh, the Criminal Queer, uh, Queerness Festival. Um, you know, uh, in 1972, I was arrested um, for making out with a guy in a car, and then I was ashamed to say that I was gay, and I thought it was so bad that I, when well, the cops came in the room and the cops said to me, why did you do it? Why were you with that guy? Why were you there? I was 16 years old. They said, did you do it for money? I said, yeah, I did it for money, and they slapped me with a prostitution charge. And I was 16 at the time in Long Island. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff still happens even in this country, the United States of America. So I admire, from a very personal level, the work that you're doing to bring that forward about what's happening in other countries, but also to remind us here in this country that we need to fight back against that. Today, for example, the Supreme Court ruled against our transgender community in a terrible ruling that's going to have a terrible effect on them. And before coming into the hearing today, I held a press conference in Jackson Heights because um, a victim of a hate crime was arrested on an alleged assault charge. The victim, in other words, was charged with a crime, whereas the perpetrator was, was he was arrested, he was given a desk appearance ticket, while the, other, while the gay guy had to go to jail for 27 hours. So that type of harassment still continues, even in this country, but I thank you both for your, for your courage and for being able to do this. I d yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It really takes a lot of courage. You know, I represent a very large immigrant community, and I hear these stories oftentimes from people who are seeking asylum here in this country, and oftentimes then find out that they have to face the same type of oppression here uh, in our neighborhoods as they did back in their country. But anyway, that, that being said, 
Um, I, I, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Eric Marcus, thank you for your compliments, and it's always a pleasure to work with you, Eric. You are really like the foremost historian on all this stuff, and uh, reading your books is, is, is really important. I urge everyone to do that. Um, I, one thing that I noticed is that the Department of Education is not included on your list. Are they actually working with you on Stonewall 50? That's a good question. We originally had the Department of Education um, on our list and then were asked to pull them. Um, so, I And then we're asked to what? To pull them from the list. Um, pull them from the list? Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't recall the reason why. Do you recall, Inga? No. It was a while ago. Um, so the, the department, um, the, the LGBTQ liaison from the Department of Education attends, uh, att often attends our meetings. So I'm not following. If, if he comes, then isn't he representing the Department of Education? Uh, possibly not in an official capacity. So I haven't, I have not pursued that. Well, this is not good news. Yeah. And um, the mayor's office, who's represented here right now, needs to get on top of that ASAP because this is unacceptable in this day and age. And this is something that I've been fighting for since I've been in the council. And um, uh, my, my view of what's going on with Stonewall 50, we know the history. We kind of lived through the history, especially you and I, old men that we are. Um, but um, we need to make sure that our young people understand and know how we got to where we are to today. Um, and, 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 and the DOE must be, and be a participant in this as well. So um, hopefully that will be corrected. And then um, with all the organizations here as well, um, what I would like to do is to encourage them to reach out to the schools. Maybe every organization represented here today could adopt a school and invite them to their events um, so that they can participate and learn and see some of the art activities, the cultural activities that are going on. And I think that would be really important toward educating our youth. Um, and uh, so I, I just want to thank you. Of course, at Stonewall 25, I was there at the New York Public Library. The only criticism I would have, and, and I addressed it in my other questions to the other panel, was that um, uh, it did not include stuff from the outer boroughs and um, was colorless, so to speak. Um, and so I hope that we're going to fix that a little bit as we, as we move along. Danny, as much as I, I hate correcting you, um, Jean Manford was represented in that. Um, exhibit. Uh, she, she was represented, but not much of the other organizing that went on. And Jean did a lot of her organizing in Manhattan. So one of the things I am interested in seeing, Eric, is actually what happened in the grassroots you know what, out in the boroughs. I stand corrected. You're right. She was represented for the, the national work that she did with, with PFLAG. Yeah. I apologize. And, and I think there may have been one poster in that exhibit. But anyway, yeah. I, I, my hope is that because, you know, so many of the, the folks of color, for example, do live in the outer boroughs, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm aiming, what I'm aiming for here. Just one last thing, Danny, um, uh, Council Member Drum, um, we would welcome the participation of the Department of Education. Um, I know our members, many of our members are planning programs for uh, teens throughout the city, uh, school students. It would be terrific to have significant involvement of the Department of Education. Okay, good. I, I'm going to really you know, make sure that that happens, so okay. that'll be corrected Great, quickly. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your kind words. Absolutely. Did you want to say something about the public library or no? Uh, yeah, and just um, that's as I'm curating the exhibition, and that is one of our focuses is to make sure that the experiences of people of color in that era are represented and also for our programming. So we have, so we represent Staten Island, Manhattan, and the Bronx, and so that's a focus of the programming is the local history, uh, local LGBTQ history, and so two of the places be Bronx Library Center and Stapleton and Staten Island, which are going to be the hubs for programming in those boroughs. Okay, good. Thank you. And then for Heritage of Pride, New York City Pride, um, I know that there is a resist movement that is um, planning or working on a march of their own. And I was just curious to know, is there any coordination between your organization and that group of people? Uh, we've had lots of conversations with uh, RPC in, in the last uh, year. Uh, you know, there's just differences in terms of vision, um, but you know, we welcome um, collaboration, collaboration and we're always kind of willing to talk further with anyone. Do you know where that stands right now? Uh, I don't, we're kind of out of the loop in terms of where those discussions are, are had with, or with the city right now, but 
um, we're just kind of going forward with, with what we have planned. Okay, and I just really encourage that, and um, I want to say I'm old enough also to remember Marsha P. Johnson standing on the corner of 6th Avenue saying, uh, you know, pay it, no, never mind, let's move over to 5th Avenue and take 5th Avenue, and we actually had to take 5th Avenue without permission from the mayor at the time, and so that is an important part of our history that uh, we remember the struggle to even get on to 5th Avenue, so I hope that that situation works out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and as part of our digital resources, we could accept uh, photos of Councilmember Drum at Stonewall 25, if you happen to have any available. Uh, just uh, w one final question. So we heard about the DOE's participation. We know DCLA's participation. We know NYPL's participation. Uh, can you a answer whether there are any other uh, city agencies that are, are participating and to what degree? Okay, Eric. I'd have to look at my list quickly, but uh, no, I believe it's, you, you've said which ones are involved with us, and that covers it. Yeah. Um, I just also want to add um, uh, to Council Member um, Drum's concerns about, about representation from across the city. We've been thrilled by the numbers of organizations that have joined the consortium from across the city, and we've reached out to uh, council members to get their input so that we could reach out when uh, we needed to to get organizations to join us. We are still eager for local organizations to join the um, Stonewall 50 Consortium. So if any members of the council know of organizations that are not currently on the list, but should be, please get in touch with us. And the information is in the um, uh, printed testimony. Thank you. And the committee will be following up on, on the DOE issue. Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, dismissed. And the next panel will be a performance uh, by Michael J. Washington. Michael B. Washington. Michael B. I'm, I apologize. To, I apologize. Michael B. Washington. I apologize again. Can everyone hear me without the microphone? Do you need this? Okay, great. Um, my name is Michael Benjamin Washington. I'm an actor and playwright. Uh, this summer I appeared in the 50th anniversary of Boys in the Band on Broadway and uh, about five years ago I wrote a play for the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington called Blueprints to Freedom and Ode to Bayard Rustin. How many people know who Bayard Rustin is here? Excellent. Yes, I knew I came to the right room. Um, Felicia Rashad directed this and we were presented in a world premiere at La Jolla Playhouse, Kansas City Rep. And this summer for Stonewall 50 we'll be doing a full production of a reading for uh, Rattlestick Theater, and I'm very, very grateful for them for asking me to do that. Uh, I'm going to do a small excerpt from my play. In this play, it concerns Bayard Rustin, the openly gay architect of the civil rights movement, who was Dr. Martin Luther King's mentor and taught him pretty much everything he knew about nonviolence, civil disobedience from his education from Gandhi, but was relegated to the shadows by the civil rights leaders and Dr. King because of his homosexuality. So this play takes place in June of 1963, where he is given two months to plan the March on Washington, uh, along with his trusty female assistant, Miriam. And this is in honor of his mentor, A. Philip Randolph. <clears throat> so in this particular scene, he and Dr. King, who have been estranged for about two years, have to get back on the same accord in time for Dr. King to sign up to do the 11 o'clock number. Last night, after I finished my calendar, I went to witness the million-dollar paycheck Miss Elizabeth Taylor has tucked in her pocketbook. The chronicles of the young queen of Egypt as she resists the imperialist ambitions of Rome. Whilst banished from our movement here at home, I went to Rome, then to Egypt, which is in Africa, then to protest nuclear testing in the Sahara Desert, also in Africa. And you know what amazes me, Minister? It amazes me that in Africa, with our people, same hue, same hair, same noses and the like, our people seem to concern themselves with only one characteristic concerning me, my ability. My ability to speak the truth and speak it to the highest power. 
speak truth to power, we chant. My ability to organize, to live my birthright as a Quaker, to live and teach the true meaning of Jesus Christ, not just preach it from a pulpit. Please, minister, I've waited to breathe. Let me. When I was passed over as the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which I set up so you could speak as the head and not the tail, I played it humbly. It wasn't my time. When it was time for me to excuse myself from the movement because of the threat that I'd be exposed, I did so gracefully. Eventually, I fell back into the good graces, or at least the tolerance of leadership. But when you dismissed me from the movement because of a lie, an intentional falsehood concocted by a rival Negro leader, a congressman, a minister, who functioned under the direct command of the leaders of the House and Senate, you never thought for a second to spare me, Martin. You let Adam Clayton Powell remove me from the movement because of a lie. When Adam Clayton Powell threatened to expose you and me as homosexual lovers, I had but one choice. He did concoct a lie. I did turn against you. We have been derailed. But that was over two years ago. And God has brought us back together by it not to agree on the past or even understand it, but to be God-fearing and mature enough to look past our differences. Something happened to me in that jail cell in Birmingham by it. Something shifted in me. Shifted in me the wrong way. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to call our next panel, and in no particular order, although we seem to be putting them in a particular order. <laughs> Sorry. Ken, get back. Okay. Again, uh, Ken Lusbador, Ryan Leach, Frank Carucci, Daniela Topol and Doug Nevin, and Sasha Wurzel. And uh, we do have several panels after this, so we'll be uh, setting a three-minute timer. So we're going to start with uh, Frank and Ryan as they have a video, am I correct? In? Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Just, uh, um, is, the, is, is the video set up or is it? Uh, yeah, it should be on the computer. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll play that at the end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Carucci. I'm the president of La Mama Experimental Theatre Club. I'm very happy to be here and have the opportunity to participate in this fantastic uh, celebration that's coming. La Mama is um, uh, represented by our artistic director, Mia Yu, and our staff. So I'm here for them. Um, we're 57 years old, and I'm proud to say we just received a Tony Award for Outstanding Regional uh, Theater this year. Um, our legacy has always been about supporting new artists. 
um, people who wouldn't have an opportunity to perform anywhere else. And uh, that's been true for 50 years, 57 years from the very beginning, um, which led to groups like the Trocadero Gloxinia Ballet, the Ridiculous Theaters, there were two of them, uh, and numerous artists, uh, too many to mention now, but uh, Ryan will tell you about some of them. Um, before Angels in America, before The Normal Heart, Harvey Firestein defined what makes an alternative family in his great plays, The Torch Song Trilogy, trilogy which recently closed on Broadway a few weeks ago. Um, La Mama has had an ongoing relationship with the New York City Board of Education. Uh, we've done many, many uh, programs, but we were the, among the first to go to the Harvey Milk School in their original site on the West Side Highway and bring artists there and bring them uh, to La Mama. Uh, we've worked with other groups, many, many of them. I myself, um, did a series of fundraising events for what was called the New York City, um, the New York City uh, AIDS Education Center. I don't think it exists because I think the whole program was abandoned with a just say no kind of a philosophy to take over. But we worked uh, bringing um, students from all cross sections of the city, all parts of the city, uh, mainly the alternative schools, which had very little participation in the arts. And we uh, did our final one a number of years ago with the entire New York City gay, gay uh, chorus, working with our students and doing some really thrilling um, activities. Uh, this whole thing is very personal to me because I was at a Stonewall uh, 50 whatever years, 50 years ago. I lived next door uh, to the building at 45 Christopher Street. I was home that night and heard this commotion. Am, is my time up? My, my, there's this commotion outside and um, looked out the window and indeed this uh, riot was going on. I went downstairs. My building was surrounded by horse barricades and nobody could get to us because there was a paddy wagon from my building uh, to the Stonewall Bar. But people within the building were able to get out and I went down with my friend and we looked out and we saw this paddy wagon where they were uh, putting uh, the guys they were pulling out of the bar including some drag queens into the, what was then called the paddy wagon. Um, we waited for the right moment, snuck out the door and opened the back doors of the paddy wagon and were able to usher a couple of the guys out of the wagon into the lobby down a, a stairwell and down the street to an emergency fire exit down the block. So um, I always remembered uh, how proud we were that we did that little thing while people were pulling parking meters out of the street and ramming in doors. In any event, um, this is going to be a very important year for me, and uh, I'm going to stop now and let my managing associate, Ryan Leach, tell you about some of the programs and activities that we have scheduled for this year. Thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, we're thrilled to participate in the Stonewall 50 celebration as a member of the Stonewall 50 consortium. And La Mama has always been an international institution recognized as a seedbed of new work by artists of all nations and cultures. And in 57 years, we've presented more than 150,000 artists from more than 70 nations. So we welcome all World Pride participants to New York City, and we share their vision of a world where there is full cultural, social, and legal equality for all. Uh, our theater predates Stonewall. Our archive remains an enlightening resource of pre-Stonewall queer performance. The gay scene in New York in the 1960s was an underground whose gathering places included La Mama. Some members of our La Mama family who remember the Stonewall riots are still alive today, including Frank. Uh, the work of these artists often spoke frankly about and even celebrated marginalized sexualities and gender identities in a way that shocked even the existing avant-garde movement. 
So I'll talk a little bit about our Stonewall 50 celebration and festival. Uh, this whole season of our performances have queer performers, including Kink House by Gunner Montana, Vagina Town by Murr. The Stonewall 50 will include four different productions from May 30th to June 30th at La Mama. La Mama Squirts is one of those productions, which continues an incredible lineup of intergenerational queer performance. Past performers have included Justin Vivian Bond, Kate Bornstein, Stephen Winter, Sarah Schulman, Pamela Sneed, Charlene, Theta Hamill, Shay Diamond, Jess Tom, Patty Harrison, and the incredible House of Labasia, in partnership with the Helix Queer Performance Network. This performance also serves to fundraise for charities that advocate for queer people, including the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, New Alternatives, the Audre Lorde Project, and Trans Women of Color Collective. Stonewall 50 at La Mama celebrates World Pride with exciting voices from around the globe, with multiple generations of queer performers as they pose questions, honor legacies, and ignite the present. Italy's Rocco Salvino brings Global Gay, Korea's Byung Kuan and Guille Lee bring 13 fruitcakes, and the Bearded Ladies Cabaret from Philadelphia will perform Contradict This, a birthday funeral for heroes, all included in our brochure that you have. All of our programming is affordable and accessible with tickets never more than $30. And we would appreciate your help in spreading the word to your constituents, especially young people who can engage with this important work, including our archive, and let them know that they can find a rich history of queer performance and connect with performers who will redefine this history. For example, our archive will be open during the entire month and um, we also have uh, a lot of space, rehearsal studios and places where people can meet. And we always encourage nonprofit organizations to contact us to arrange a situation that's affordable and accessible to use those spaces. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. And can you state your name for the record? Ryan Leach. Thank you. And uh, sh are we ready with the video? Uh huh. Thank you. And this is from Squirts, one of our performances. It's a promo video. Thank you. Thank you. That'll be tough to follow, um, but I think we'll go with Ken next. Ken, if you could just state your name, and uh, if possible, if we can keep to the three-minute timer, uh, we do have copies of all your written testimony, so that will be entered in the record. So, Ken. Whoop. Uh, Ken Lusbader for the record, and at home it was two minutes and 59 seconds. So, <laughs> um, good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important topic and upcoming celebrations. As I said, I'm Ken Lesbader, one of the co-founders and co-directors of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project, a cultural heritage initiative and educational resource that is comprehensively identifying, cataloging, and interpreting sites connected to the LGBT history and culture of New York City. We're also members of the Stonewall 50 Consortium. 
Launched in 2015 by preservation professionals, the project seeks to make an invisible history visible by identifying historic LGBT locations that establish a visceral link to the city's past on what has largely been an unknown narrative. Beyond the already recognized Stonewall, we are identifying hundreds of existing sites from the city's early days to the year 2000 that illustrate the richness of LGBT history and the community's contributions to American culture. Our project website features an interactive map with, at the current time, 150 locations that interpret places of importance to LGBT history. We have another 350 on our database that we're adding to the website as researched. We also have a so, uh, social media presence at the handle NYC LGBT sites. The project is advocating for local designation of LGBT sites, such as the Walt Whitman residence in Brooklyn. We recently completed the historic context statement of LGBT history in New York City, which is the first ever sort of guide to uh, establishing criteria on how to evaluate LGBT sites in the five boroughs of New York City. That was done in partnership with the State Historic Preservation Office. We are also nominating sites to the National Register of Historic Places. We've been involved in six. We're nominating two more and developing educational programming. Last year, we completed an LGBT walking tour guide of sites around the immediate vicinity of Stonewall that is being distributed by the Park Service at the Stonewall National Monument. Leading up and through Stonewall 50, we are engaging the public on a series of uh, LGBT heritage projects, lectures, events, and tours. These will include traditional talks on LGBT place-based history, events such as LGBT trivia nights, LGBT walking tours of neighborhoods, uh, including LGBT rainbow pride flaggings at Woodlawn and Greenwood cemeteries. Thanks through a grant from the City Council, we are working with the Department of Education to do 20 classroom presentations about LGBT history in each specific borough um, that we are surveying and are scheduling as we speak. We are also drafting two more National Register nominations, one for the James Baldwin residence on the Upper West Side and one for the Church of Holy Apostles in Chelsea, uh, both associated with LGBT history. And we are also developing a walking tour app uh, through the sponsorship of American Express on Con Edison that we launched in May uh, in time enough for people who are visiting the city. So I will end it on that note, but I just want to stress that LGBT history is American history. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Sasha, please. State your name. Yes. Uh, Sasha Wurzel. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, council members, for this opportunity to speak about the Whitney's um, participation um, in the Stonewall 50 Consortium and our ongoing work to engage the legacy of uh, Stonewall and commemorate Stonewall 50. Uh, my name is Sasha Wurzel. I'm the director of Access and Community Programs at the Whitney Museum of American Art. The Whitney is a contemporary art museum located in Lower Manhattan. As the preeminent institution devoted to the art of the United States, the Whitney presents the full range of 20th century and contemporary American art with a special focus on living artists, many New York City residents. Um, the museum's location, which was newly opened in 2015, uh, near the Hudson River Piers and at the intersection of the Meatpacking District, Chelsea, and Greenwich Village, a short distance from where the Stonewall Riots took place, has provided a critical lens for us to engage with queer history, art, artists, and audiences, audiences in an ongoing way year-round. Um, so I'm gonna just share a little bit about some of the upcoming programming um, that we've planned in conjunction with Stonewall 50. But in addition to that, I just want to note that we have ongoing programs related to um, queer art and artists, Stonewall 50, that we'll be doing with teens, schools, families, and community organizations, and we do that on a yearly basis. So um, Friday, March 8th, we're gonna hold a queer teen night in collaboration with the LGBT Center, one of our community partners. Queer youth and allies are invited to a celebration inspired by the life and work of Andy Warhol. Youth from the center and Whitney Youth Insights leaders will welcome teens for free art making, performances, snacks, and tours of our Andy Warhol exhibition that was mentioned earlier. On Wednesday, April 17th, we'll be hosting a um, After Stonewall public program. This will be a panel of artists who will explore art and the Hudson River Piers in conjunction with the exhibition After Stonewall at Leslie Lohman Museum that is curated by art historian Jonathan Weinberg. And on Thursday, June 13th, we're gonna be holding a very large Stonewall 50 celebration at the Whitney. 
in this event will include performances by LGBTQ plus artists in the Whitney Biennial of 2019, which will open in mid-May. Um, we'll also continue on Select Fridays, May through September, a uh, program that we initiated last summer in 2018, Queer History Walks. These free sunset walking tours explore the rich queer history of the Whitney's surrounding neighborhood and make connections to the Whitney's collection and special exhibitions. We're also going to continue ongoing thematic gallery tours that surface queer themes. One example of this tour um, from 2018 was titled No One Exists Alone, Queer Belonging, which explored gender, sexuality, and LGBTQ plus perspectives in the exhibition Where We Are, selections from the Whitney's collection. Um, so we remain grateful for the ongoing support from Speaker Johnson, Chair Van Bramer, and their colleagues in the City Council, as well as the NYC Department of Cultural Affairs that has enabled us to continue this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and finally, with this panel, we'll have uh, Daniela Topol and Doug Nevin. Uh, Frank, perhaps, can I ask you to scoot over a little bit? Thank you very much, everyone. Um, Just state your name when, when you begin. Daniela Topol. Uh, it is an honor to be here and in such amazing company. We are also a proud member of the Stonewall 50 Consortium and um, proudly funded by DCLA. My name is Daniela Topol, Artistic Director of Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, and I will shortly turn this over to Doug Nevin, producer of Pride Plays, a festival of LGBTQAI plus work at Rattlestick in late June. Rattlestick is located on Waverly Place in the heart of the West Village. We are a 24-year-old theater that is dedicated to producing ambitious new works, and we are very committed to giving voice to LGBTQAI plus artists and subject matters. To this end, some of our notable past productions include Jonathan Tolan's Last Sunday in June and Byron Seller, starring Michael Urie, Lewiston and Clarkston by Samuel D. Hunter, Mashuk Dean's Draw the Circle, and My Lingerie play by Diana O. Oh. And we are currently in development for our fall 2019 production of a new play about St. Vincent's Hospital. We believe in creating an inclusive space for community to gather and engage with ambitious and dynamic theatrical work that inspires conversation and leads to positive social change. And it is for these reasons that we are very excited about our partnership with Doug Nevin and Michael Yuri, who are the creators and producers of Pride Plays, a festival that will be happening at Rattlestick from June 1 to June 24th. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Doug. Thank you, Daniela, and uh, what a pleasure it is to meet all of you. Um, as Daniela mentioned, my name is Doug Nevin, and I am an entertainment lawyer and theater producer in New York. Um, I counsel Broadway producers and productions, and when I'm not doing this, I'm advocating for artists and working to develop new talent and voices. As Daniela mentioned, Michael Yuri and I are co-producing directors of Pride Plays. Michael is a renowned award-winning actor who recently starred in the revival of Harvey Firestein's Torch Song on Broadway, and prior to that, Buyer and Seller, which I produced with Rattlestick, and Ugly Betty. Michael and I, along with our festival director, Nick Mayo, are collaborating with Rattlestick on a four-day theater festival celebrating theatrical pride. In particular, we aim to explore the twin legacies of the theater and the gay rights movement, to examine how they've intersected and indeed supported and enhanced one another. We will shine a spotlight on plays and artists who have left their mark on the community and contributed to our legacy. Our desire is to bring awareness to the artists who have shaped and continue to shape our culture through a prideful celebration of their theatrical work. This will include seminal works worth revisiting, pieces by artists lost too soon, and as you saw today, a showcase for the next generation of LGBTQIA voices. We are in the process of assembling a force of artists, writers, producers, directors, actors, designers, who will join us in exploring how pride pulsates through the theater of the last 50 years. We hope to create a uniquely New York City event where community members of diverse backgrounds, ethnicities, orientations, and age can come together to be entertained, to learn, to engage, and to remember. Audience members can expect to hear readings of plays such as William Hoffman's seminal age drama As Is and Michael Benjamin Washington's new play Blueprints to Freedom about the marginalized gay leader of the civil rights movement, which you were lucky enough to hear an excerpt of earlier this afternoon. You can also expect musical moments, symposiums of leading lights and emerging voices, and a variety of reflections on what pride means to you. We can't wait to celebrate 50 years of Stonewall and of pride by doing what theater does best bringing people together. Thank you.
Thank you, and, and thank you again for uh, sharing Michael Benjamin's performance uh, with us. Thank you, Michael, as well. Uh, Councilman Drum? Yes, and thank you, Michael Benjamin Washington. Also, we've got to get you into the schools, I think. That would be great. There's a real lesson there, you know, a um, lesson starter. I just want to say thank you to all of you. I can hardly wait myself until this is very exciting, until um, all of this stuff happens. Uh, but then maybe make another suggestion. I mentioned the Department of Education before. Certainly, I hope people are reaching out to the DOE, but also to the Administration for Children's Services for our, our youth, LGBT youth, which is at high numbers in foster home and foster care and homeless youth as well in, the, in DYCD. So hopefully people will be reaching out to those agencies to get our youth into these exhibits. And, and thank you all for coming in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Our next panel will feature Jerry Kajpust, forgive me if I didn't say that right, Eric Sawyer, Ann Northrup, and Jerry Gallagher and Sean Kokorin. <laughs> Just for the record, I'd like to recognize uh, Councilmember Kozlowitz, who will be rejoining us as the chair of this committee. Hello. Uh, I'm, I hope Councilmember Borelli has not actually left. I wanted to talk to him about Stonewall 25, but maybe we can answer some questions. I'm Ann Northrup. I am here representing the Reclaim Pride Coalition, which is planning to stage an alternative march on June 30th, Sunday, the Stonewall 50 March for Human Rights and Social Justice. Well, we gather today to discuss our plans to celebrate the legacy of the Stonewall Rebellion and the vast progress we have made in the last 50 years, and celebrate we should. But we gather on a day when the Supreme Court of the United States has told the President of the United States that he can prevent transgender people from serving in the United States military, although tens of thousands have served and continue to serve with distinction. We have a very long way to go. Millions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, asexual, two-spirit, and other people have fought for centuries to bring us to this place. And let me emphasize the verb. We have fought. No one has given us this. No one has suddenly woken up one day and decided, oh, we think we'll stop discriminating. We have demonstrated in the streets, come out to our friends and families and bosses to demand respect in the workplace and in schools. We have fought for our dignity and our rights in the medical system and on the sports field, and yes, in the military. Not to mention fighting to be alive in the onslaught of HIV and AIDS. And maybe most of all, we have had to fight for our own self-respect in the face of a world telling us we are sick disgusting, law-breaking human beings. It is a wonder that any of us have survived. So I think we've won the right to celebrate ourselves, but the fight is far from over. In this city, the NYPD still harasses and illegitimately arrests transgender youth for walking while trans, and a restaurant in the meatpacking district hassles and ejects gay patrons. While we've made some progress addressing our issues in the schools, if anyone here thinks that our schools are safe places for most of our young people, please stand up. Right. In this country, there is no federal non-discrimination law covering sexual orientation or gender identity or expression, and the Trump administration has systematically shredded and repealed the rules and regulations that protected us. 
while elevating the concept of religious freedom to insane heights specifically to hurt us. Internationally, we see fundamentalists attacking, brutalizing, and killing LGBTQ people in Chechnya, Indonesia, and Kenya with the complicity of their governments. Sorry, I, the new president, I'll be quick. The new president of Brazil, hailed by Trump, is a proud homophobe. The government of Egypt, as uh, was referred to, has just jailed a TV new newscaster for a year for interviewing a gay man. Brexit, if fulfilled, may deprive United Kingdom LGBTQ residents of the protections they currently enjoy under European Union rules. And major faith groups, many of which receive millions of dollars in grants from this council to perform what are supposed to be public services available to all, teach their followers and their children that homosexuality is evil and disordered. This is a very brief review. There is, of course, good news, too. But we at Reclaim Pride believe that we are still in the midst of the fight, not at the end. So we believe the appropriate way to mark the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion is not with the corporate floats in the Heritage of Pride Pride Parade, although peace be to them, nor is it with the over-barricading and over-policing of that event by a New York Police Department that has yet to apologize for its assaults on LGBTQ people 50 years ago and beyond, the precipitating act, after all, for the Stonewall Rebellion. One more paragraph. Reclaim Pride will mark this moment with a joyful, angry, creative, political Stonewall 50 March for Human Rights and Social Justice. On Sunday, June 30th, we will march from the Stonewall to Central Park for a rally on the Great Lawn, following the route of the first Christopher Street Liberation Day March in 1970. And every step of the way, we will remember and honor our ancestors and recommit ourselves to the fight for liberation and justice. I apologize for going over. Thank you to the city council members for uh, being here today to hear us and to government officials as well. My name is Eric Sawyer and I'm one of the founders of ACT UP New York, a co-founder of Housing Works, and after close to a decade, uh, recently retired from UNAIDS, the HIV programs at the UN. After 30 years of speaking truth to power, I know the power of political activism. At ACT UP, we fought to change how drugs are developed and to fight for medications to save our lives. At Housing Works, we fought for medically appropriate housing, care, and support. At UNAIDS, we fought for global access to HIV medications, but we also joined several UN agencies uh, in the fight for LGBT rights because homophobia fuels the HIV epidemic. While we've made some progress over the years, we have a, a long, long way to go. In the US, the current president array, uh, erased LGBT rights and all mention of the National Office of AIDS policy from the White House website on Inauguration Day. Uh, many queers have, have uh, gained their rights. Uh, many of the rights that queers have gained uh, are being overturned, especially for transgender people. Funding for domestic AIDS globally, uh, as well as domestically, are being cut by this administration. Today, we still have less than, we still have 20% of people living with HIV in the U.S. who do not have access to treatment. Globally, only about 60% of people with HIV have access to drugs. We heard from a prior speaker that 71 countries have laws that make it a crime to be, to be gay. That's out of about 180, so uh, do the math, it's close to half. Half of those countries have a mandatory prison sentence between 10 and 25 years. Eight of them, or six of them, have a death penalty. Jeez. In the US, more countries lack a law to protect LGBT people from discrimination than have it. More than half of the states in this in our country can legally fire you, employers can fire you just for being gay. 
we've heard about how in African countries and Central Asia, uh, people are literally being persecuted by government-sanctioned uh, actions, and in Chechnya, there's a concentration camp that uh, legalizes torture and has literally killed people. Because of these realities and my belief in speaking truth to power, I'm helping to or organize the Reclaim Pride March and Rally, uh, which will march from Stonewall to the Great Lawn on Central uh, Park. We feel it is really crucial for us to give a voice to people from around the world to address their plight, their lack of rights, their persecution around the globe, and to provide a vehicle for them to share the word, spread the word, uh, speak truth to power, and try to organize a more effective global response uh, in the fight for uh, gay rights, LGBTQ, et cetera, rights for everyone. We at Rec Reclaim Pride believe that no LGBT person is free until all LGBT people are free. We hope you'll join us at that march. Thank you. Um, hello, um, my name is Sean Corcoran. I'm here representing the Museum of the City of New York. Um, I um, want to thank the council for having us here today. And um, I'll be a, a bit briefer because um, Commissioner Finkel Pearl mentioned some of our activities already, so there's no reason to repeat. Um, but specifically, he didn't mention um, an exhibition that we are developing. Um, an exhibition that is uh, comprised of a, a more than 30 photographs, um, and the title is called Pride Photographs from Stonewall and Beyond by Fred McDara. Um, the exhibition is a companion show to a retrospective exhibition of, of the photographer's work that we're in, uh, in the midst of developing. Um, for those of you who might not know who Fred McDara is, he was the first photographer and picture editor for the legendary alternatively news weekly, um, The Village Voice, and is considered to be uh, by many the uh, ultimate chronicler of New York City's downtown scene, um, particularly through the 50s and 80s, through the 80s. Um, McDara was at Stonewall in 1969 and took some of the, the few photographs that exist from the uprising uh, and its immediate aftermath. Uh, and later, later in 1969, he photographed a rally in Washington Square Park, and then, of course, in 1970, the, the first um, um, march um, uh, on the uprising's anniversary. Uh, Fred uh, continued to photograph marshes and create portraits of community leaders and document significant events uh, of the LGBT community, LGBTQ community throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, the exhibition coincides with the publication of, um, the, actually I should say the, repub the republication, the expanded edition of his original book that was published on the 25th anniversary of Stonewall. Um, this is called, this new edition is called Pride Photographs After Stonewall and includes a new foreword by Hilton Alls. Um, the museum is very proud to be a, um, a member of the Stonewall 50 Consortium and uh, our very happy and, and proud to be a participating member as we were at the 25th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Capus, Leslie Lohman Museum, Gay and Lesbian Art. Thank you, Chair Koslowitz and the Committee on Community Affairs, or Cultural Affairs, Libraries, International Relations Group. We look forward to celebrating the 50th anniversary of Stonewall Uprising on June, 5th, June 28th 19, or 2019 that signifies a crucial and historic milestone for the LGBT community, the city of New York, and our organization, the Leslie Lohman Museum. Our mission is already, our museum is already a key LGBTQ destination, and we have planned a blockbuster exhibition that supports the I Love NY LGBT initiative through the state of the city. Time for the 50th anniversary year of Stonewall, Art After Stonewall, is the first major exhibition to examine the impact of LGBTQ civil rights movement on the art world. Comprising some 200 artworks and documents, the exhibition focuses on openly LGBTQ artists like Nan Golden, Holly Hughes, Robert Maplethorpe, Tim Miller, Catherine Opie, and will draw upon private collectors and several institutions that will lend work to the exhibition. We are partnering with the New York University Gray Art Gallery to display the exhibition, which will be on view from April 24th to July 21st. 
We welcome the hundreds of mainstream cultural institutions that are joining the celebration. However, it is important to celebrate the LGBTQ culture every day. LGBT arts and cultural history are an important part of New York City history, and we as an LGBTQ-focused cultural institution play an important role in preserving and telling the story of the community and its fight for civil rights. The origins of the Les Lohman Museum can be traced back to the civil rights movement of the late 1960s. In the context of Woodstock Music and Art Fair and Stonewall Gate in Uprising, gay art collectors Charles Leslie and Fritz Lohman presented their first exhibition of gay artists in their Soho loft in the summer of 1969. In the midst of the 70s gay liberation movement, our founders continued to exhibit the work of gay artists in storefronts in Soho, finally setting in a basement space at 127 Prince Street, which became host to art exhibitions and cultural programs. Leslie and Lohman were also activists in the pre uh, preservation of the Soho neighborhood and unique architecture and the nascent community of artists living and working in spacious lofts. During the AIDS pandemic, Charles and Fritz opened their refuge for artists and their work Providing lodging and caring for artists, they rescued work from dying artists from families out of shame, ignorance, or inability to properly preserve their work. Today, thanks to the hard work of generations of activists and artists, our community has gained a greater visibility. However, the fight for our rights is not over. The foundation has transitioned into a museum that aims to preserve LGBT cultural identity and build community, reclaim scholarship from a queer perspective, and provide a training ground for queer artists and cultural workers. As we continue to stand at the intersection of art and social justice, we act as a cultural hub for LGBTQ individuals and their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I um, really appreciate you coming in. I um, hope you're working on the Stonewall film as well. Yes, Danny. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, in the works. And um, for the New York City Museum, I remember taking my class there when I was a teacher, uh, and uh, you had an exhibition on the struggle to get into the St. Patrick's Parade, mm -hmm. uh, which was quite eye-opening for my students as well. Although they all figured I'd be, you know, part of that struggle as well. But I also want to thank Anne and, um, and the ACT UP uh, uh, for coming in today and to recognize um, your continuous fight um, for recognizing that we're not finished. And I want to lend my support to your efforts. Uh, you. And I just want to ask where you're at with the city and uh, what type of permits, and how is that process going? And, and I want to thank Eric specifically for what he said about uh, this March being conceived to provide a voice and an organizing tool for people from around the world who will be coming here and who always benefit from these kinds of marches. Uh, we submitted about three months ago permit applications to the NYPD for the march and to the New York City Parks Department for the event on the Great Lawn. We are currently in very amicable talks with the Parks Department about the Great Lawn event. Uh, Eric is taking the lead on a lot of the organizing of the logistics for that. Uh, Norman Siegel, legendary civil rights attorney, is working with us. Uh, he also worked with us for Stonewall 25 on the dueling marches then. That's a whole other history. Um, and is working with us and the Parks Department to make sure we work all that out. The NYPD, three months later, has not contacted us, so we contacted them last week, and we are uh, working on setting up a meeting with them to discuss the logistics of our march. Uh, let me be clear that uh, we, we have a very different agenda from the Pride Parade. We have met with them repeatedly for months, some months ago, and we just agreed to disagree that they have their agenda, we have our agenda, and we are two very different events, and we are not looking to uh, collide or interfere with their event, nor are they, as Chris Frederick said, very nicely uh, looking to interfere with us. Uh, and so we are uh, planning to pull off uh, an event that will be peaceful and inclusive and inspiring. You're looking to go up 6th Avenue? That's the idea. And to do it early enough that we will not uh, coincide with the uh, Pride Parade, which doesn't step off till noon, higher up on 7th Avenue. We wanna just 
lickety split go up six to Central Park. My joke is that we can do it in 15 minutes because we have no floats, but I think that may be an exaggeration. Thank you, Anne, and I, I also I concur with you um, on Heritage of Pride. You know, they do this year after year after year. It's a very difficult chore. They were very, very helpful to me when I started Queen's Pride, and I do want to recognize that and thank you. They work the very hard all year long, and they have an enormous, enormous task to accomplish, and we uh, appreciate that. We just want to put on a very different kind of event. Understood. And, and uh, there was mention before of the Stonewall uh, 25th anniversary march, which um, mm -hmm. Ann and I were involved in the organizing. It was primarily an act up uh, driven event. And during that negotiation process, the police actually never grant us, granted us um, a permit at all. They basically a few days and, and Norman was involved uh, in our uh, attempts legally and, and in negotiation with the police to get that uh, mark, that march sanctioned and to get a police permit. But a few days before, they basically said, look, we're not giving you a permit. We'll do what we can to facilitate your march uh, because we know you're going to do it anyhow. Uh, we fear that that may be the scenario that um, is unfolding for uh, this year, but if you or the mayor's office or anyone uh, would be willing to weigh in uh, with us to the police department and encourage uh, a permit granting, that certainly would be welcome. We'd also appreciate any work on uh, getting an apology from the police department and the city for Stonewall and all the uh, actions against the LGBT community then and over the years. It's, I'm fighting the police department today, Ann. I, I understand know, completely. So, you know. Um, Me too. <laughs> I was not waiting for that apology. I do congratulate yeah. you and thank you for the work that you're doing. It's very, very important. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. And the one thing that hasn't been mentioned about Stonewall 25, of course, was the Gay Games, which was a two-week Olympic event. Uh, it's the biggest sporting event in the world, and it came here in 94 because of Stonewall 25 and was an enormous event in all the boroughs of the city. Closing ceremonies were in Yankee Stadium. I was one of the organizers of that, and that was huge. Nothing like this year, but huge. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Next panel, Ali Rickard, Brooklyn Museum. Wes Enos. Olivia Casarino, Richard Lieberman, and Ines Asian. Okay, you may begin. Okay. <laughs> Who's gonna begin? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here with um, such supportive people in the audience and I, and the council members, particularly the chair, Karen Kostelwitz, who I've known for many years. The archive was created by Arthur's office, and so we met a long time ago. Danny Drum, who's been a major supporter of everything we're doing at LaGuardia Community College, and especially the recent LGBTQ efforts. So Karen, Danny, thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the record, state your name. Richard Lieberman, 
born in Brooklyn, teaching Queens. <laughs> Let that be on the record. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I find myself taking notes about everybody I want to work with who's here and all of the creative uh, projects we can do this year. Uh, I teach at LaGuardia Community College. CUNY is now officially in the room. Education is now officially in the room. Queens is here. And so I represent many, many uh, people and may wear many hats. We educate 50,000 people a year at LaGuardia Community College. Half of our student population is foreign born. And you ready for this? They come from 150 countries. There are 119 language groups in the halls of LaGuardia Community College. You can applaud whenever you want. I'm delighted to discuss the major initiatives at uh, the archives in the context of Stonewall 50. Since 2016, which seemed like yesterday, and now I realize is almost gonna be three years ago, we accessioned the papers of New York City Council Member Daniel Drum co-founder of the Queen's Pride Parade in 1993, and since then, we've worked very hard on a robust agenda with LaGuardia students and faculty, and with all of the other CUNY campuses in Queens, five CUNY campuses working together on LGBTQ projects. While we understand the historical importance of the Stonewall Rebellion in Manhattan as a catalyst in the battle for LGBTQ rights in the nation, we decidedly shifted the focus to Queens to illustrate the pride and protest of a community unknown to most New Yorkers. Indeed, until the 1990s, most New Yorkers associated the city's LGBTQ population solely with Greenwich Village. Our initiative is to broaden that. Our initiative is to say this is a city of five boroughs and there is LGBTQ community outside of Greenwich Village. Our initial program was an exhibition, The Lavender Line, coming out in Queens. Uh, it opened at the Queens Museum in 2017 to mark the 25th anniversary of the Queens Pride Parade. It used photographs, flyers, video, audio, uh, which illustrated the fight for LGBTQ activists for equality and dignity in Queens since the 1990s. And I would like to personally thank Danny Drum for the historical portion of the exhibit. What we're planning on now, I, I heard the bell, so I'll skip to what we're planning on, is that the next exhibit will be about the LGBT community at LaGuardia Community College. We're asking some tough questions for our students, our LGBT students to answer, looking at their lives, looking at what it's like to be Latino and gay, what it's like to be black and lesbian, what it's like to be Asian and queer, We'll be launching an exhibit in May and June on this topic, and I'm proud to say that sitting next to me is my pleasure to introduce Olive Casarino. Olive is an English major at LaGuardia Community College and president of the Straight and Gay Alliance Student Club on campus, and is here with me today to talk about not only her participation in the upcoming exhibit, but also about her pleasure to testify here, probably her first te time testifying before the city council. Olive. Good afternoon, members of the New York City Council. Oh, this is on now. Um, I'm Olive Casareno, a student at LaGuardia Community College and the president of the College's Straight and Gay Alliance. I'm here to speak briefly about my experience with the archives and the impact their work has had and will continue to have for our school's LGBT population. As is the case for many other LGBT youth, I've had significant challenges with accepting my own identity. My experience coming from a devoutly religious immigrant family contributed greatly to my personal challenges with accepting myself. As the president of LaGuardia Straight and Gay Alliance, I've been able to foster community with many other students who have faced similar experiences. Each LGBT individ identifying individual I've met at LaGuardia has a unique story, which incorporates the many challenges they strive to overcome. Each story is important, which is why the Archives Lavender Line project is so significant to our community. Until only recently, the representation of LGBT individuals in pop culture and history has been unfortunately slim. This has made the acceptance of LGBT individuals difficult for those who do not identify within the community and even those who do. I remember hardly seeing LGBT people in the media while I was growing up and every celebrity coming out story being treated as controversial and shocking. I went to public schools up until high school and I cannot recall any mention of LGBT individuals in the historical curriculum. Even though the validity of social media's positive impact on the world is often questioned, it has undeniably contributed to the newer generation's acceptance of the LGBT community. 
However, it is so important for the stories of LGBT individuals to be considered and recorded in more formal settings. The Archives Lavender Line project has made it possible for the intersectional stories of several LGBT students at LaGuardia to be documented and saved for historical and academic purposes. It's an awesome opportunity for one's own narrative to be acknowledged. I would like to thank the New York City Council for your support with the LGBT Public History Project at the LaGuardia and Wagner Archives. It's so important to raise awareness about the history and culture of our city's LGBT population. Thank you for your time. Thank you and good afternoon to the members of the New York City Council and all of my fellow appreciators of history or who are here today to help commemorate the historical 50th anniversary of Stonewall. My name is Wes Enos and I'm the founder and executive director of the Generations Project, a fiscally sponsored nonprofit organization based here in New York City. The Generations Project preserves the history of the LGBTQ movement and promotes intergenerational support through storytelling. Our teams facilitate intergenerational workshops and film live storytelling events to document and share the history of the LGBTQ movement to people of all ages. We have made it a priority to not just celebrate pride during pride months, but to memorialize the journeys that have led us to where we are today all year long. The Generations Project is creating the Stonewall 50 time capsule. So imagine if there were a time capsule from the year 1969 created for the communities of New York City that contained messages, stories, photos, and wishes from those who helped spark the LGBTQ plus movement. What if up to 1,000 LGBTQ plus groups or individuals in this 2019 year each received an envelope created in 1969 from someone who directly experienced the impact of the Stonewall Rebellion? What lessons would we learn? What stories could be inspired to share with others? For the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, the Generations Project is utilizing our intergenerational platform and cross-generational programs to build the Stonewall 50 time capsule, which will be stored for 50 years until it is opened for the 100th anniversary of Stonewall in the year 2069. The Stonewall 50 time capsule will be a physical manifestation of the LGBTQ plus movement captured through the perspectives of people of all ages and all backgrounds. From now until June 2020, so a year after the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, the Generations Project is engaging groups and individuals to collect, donate, and generate primary resources, such as photos, handwritten memories, diaries, etc., to be sealed in manila-sized envelopes through our three avenues. The first is participating in the Generations Project workshops or attending one of our live storytelling events. Portable photo printers and prompts will be available. We have also, the second is we've created a prompted do-it-yourself free write uh, to attach with photos. And the third is to engage groups in group projects, such as uh, gr projects that explore the history of A, organizations, B, neighborhoods, and C, individuals. We will collect the community-generated content between June 2019 and June 2020. The Stonewall 50 time capsule will be sealed in June 2020 to commemorate the first march in 1970 by the Gay Liberation Front. All participants who contribute to building the Stonewall 50 time capsule will, will receive a golden ticket to the 2069 Stonewall 50 time capsule opening party. Within their lifetimes, golden ticket recipients will be encouraged to attend the 2069 opening party or pass their golden ticket to someone to attend in their place, which will be creating a unique intergenerational opportunity missing in the LGBT community. The Stonewall 50 time capsule will contain detailed instructions for a special committee to be formed during or before 2068 under the discretion of A, the Generations Project Incorporated, or B, the Stonewall 50 Consortium, or C, the largest collective group of LGBTQ plus organizations collaborating together to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Stonewall. Unless a more suitable location is secured, the Stonewall 50 time capsule will reside at the LGBT Center's archives until it is open in the year 2069. Uh, for anyone who would like to get involved, you can visit our website at thegenerationsproject.org to learn about joining an intergenerational storytelling workshop, attending one of our live events, or to state your intention to contribute to the Stonewall 50 time capsule. I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Koslowitz and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify about the Brooklyn Museum's programming and exhibitions in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. My name is Ali Ricard, and I'm curatorial assistant for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the museum, and I'm joined by my colleague, Catherine Almonte, Government and Community Affairs Liaison. We are here on behalf of the Brooklyn Museum and as members of the Cultural Institution Group. Um, and I'm one of, five, one of five curators working collectively on a special exhibition that will be opening later this year. On May 3rd, the Brooklyn M Museum will open the only exhibition dedicated to the work of LGBTQ artists born since 1969 and working in the legacy of the Stonewall Uprising. The artists included in Nobody Promised You Tomorrow, Art 50 Years After Stonewall, at once look to history and face the future to pay tribute to activists for parents and ask how we will care for tomorrow's generations. The exhibition also centers attention on the everyday acts of care that undergird public activism and sustain communities. Through painting, sculpture, installation, performance, and video, the artists engage interconnected themes of revolt, commemoration, care, and desire. They grapple with the unique conditions of our political time and question how moments become monuments. The exhibition centers artists of, colors, uh, artists of color and trans and gender nonconforming artists. Uh, Nobody Promise You Tomorrow is supplemented by an interactive resource room for visitors to engage LGBTQ histories and organizing and to connect with community organizations. Uh, as a Stonewall 50 Consortium member, we'll be working closely with community partners to expand conversations around art and LGBTQ organizing and history. Um, we'll present performances and public programs that center intergenerational dialogue. And just last week, we invited over a dozen LGBTQ organizations throughout New York City to convene at the museum and discuss the exhibition and different possibilities for collaborations. Beyond this exhibition, the Brooklyn Museum is continuously committed to welcoming and serving the LGBTQ community. Every year, LGBTQ teens join us for a paid internship that explores gender and sexuality in art and plans events for other LGBTQ youth. Um, throughout the run of Nobody Promised You Tomorrow, this program will be supplemented by our ongoing expansive education programs, um, which offer different program opportunities from toddlers to teenagers. Um, the exhibition will also extend our commitment beyond our annual public programs, such as our Dapper Q Fashion Show and Pride First Saturday, and will deepen our dedication to providing inclusive programming year-round. Furthermore, we will be improving accessibility in our restrooms this year. Um, we'll be making a permanent change to our bathroom facilities, which will offer visitors multi-stall, all-gender restrooms for the first time at our museum, and we're excited to offer all of our visitors safe and inclusive options, not only for the run of Nobody Promise You Tomorrow, but into the future. Thank you, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Nobody else on the panel? No? Okay, all right, thank you. And um, how do teenagers get involved in the internship? Sure, so it's a paid internship program that's run through our education department, and they can apply to be a part of the program. Um, and then once they're accepted into the program, they work um, with our teen programs in education to um, plan events around exhibitions. We have teen nights that happen for every major exhibition. Um, and there's also an extensive education component um, where they're learning about art and sexuality and meeting with curators and other members of the museum. And what do they do? They go to the Brooklyn Museum website? Yes, it's all available on the Brooklyn Museum website. OK, great. I hope you'll invite me to see some of that or of course. participate in some of that. We would well. welcome you. Okay. <laughs> I went to the Bowie exhibit, so that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then this is a very interesting project, the Time Capsule, and that's going to be at the center, if I'm not mistaken, that's what you said? Yeah, it will, it'll be created now until June 2020, and then it is set to reside at the center until 2069, okay. yeah, unless we find a better, more suitable location for it. Okay, because they have a, an archive there as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And then in a shameless exa um, example of uh, self-promotion, I want to hold up these two items. Uh, this is the book on the history of Queen's Pride. Uh, a couple of pictures of a council member are in there. And the latest project of the uh, LaGuardia Community College archives is this wonderful calendar out and about LGBTQ life in New York City. And um, it documents a lot of the history of New York City in general, but also including some of the borough stuff, but particularly also focused a lot in on Queens. And so these are available free just by connecting LaGuardia. How do you get that, Richard? 
So just contact me at LaGuardia Community College. You can Google LaGuardia and Wagner Archives. You can Google my name, Richard Lieberman, and you can see me after this, and I'll give you my card, and you can get not only calendars for you, but also for your group. Uh, we published, uh, I think, 10,000 calendars, so we have lots of calendars. The books, uh, I think we have a few hundred, and if there's a tremendous demand, we'll try to raise money and publish more. There's another book coming out at Queensboro, so just see me or uh, Google LaGuardia and Wagner Archives and uh, Richard Lieberman, and I'll get you as many calendars as you need. And Olivia, I think you may be the most important person in the room here today, because uh, by you coming out and um, acknowledging your membership in the Gay Straight Alliance um, and uh, giving testimony here today, this is exactly what it's all about. It's what all of the work that we're doing is all about, is trying to make it easier for folks who are LGBT plus, um, much easier for them. And so um, I, I really admire you being here and thank you for giving testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually did I get she wanted to speak. Oh, okay, no, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, I was at the side of the table. Oh, yes. My name is Ines Aslan, and I represent uh, the New York Historical Society. As you might know, New York Historical is the oldest museum in the city. It was founded in 1804 after the city had been burned to the ground twice. And so its purpose is to preserve and share the history of the city and us, its people. And so in the context of that, we served annually over half a million people, and half of them are actually public school students, um, which we service with New York and American History Curriculum K-12. Um, it is in the context of that um, that we're planning to commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising uh, with that initiative. Um, that it's called Stonewall 50 at New York Historical that includes three different exhibitions as well as public programs and family programs and a few education initiatives like professional development for uh, teachers with Stonewall related curriculum as well as uh, camps and uh, programs for students. Um, we actually started uh, commemorating the year in June when we um, displayed uh, a special installation about Billie Jean King in LaGuardia Airport uh, related to uh, the US Open time frame. And we also have currently on view an exhibition called Billie Jean King Road to 75 that celebrates her 75th birthday. We've actually um, were given her archives once she found out that we had started the Center for Women's History because she could relate to the idea that women's history, as well as every, every person's history, and that's why we're here today, is part of American history, and it's not a separate kind of history that needs to be told on the side. Um, so I'll be happy to tell you quickly about what the three exhibitions are about. Um, the first one is called Letting Loose and Fighting Back. LGBTQ nightlife before and after Stonewall, and we'll explore the history of LGBTQ bars, clumps at nightlife in New York City during the second half of the 1900s. The second exhibition is called By the Force of Our Presence, highlights from the lesbian history archives, and will feature, um, feature a rich selection of objects highlighting lesbian experiences before and after Stonewall, the central role of queer women in LGBTQ activism, and the ongoing significance of the lesbian her story archives. And the third one is a special graphic installation called Say It Loud, Out and Proud, 50 Years of Pride, that will use imagery from five decades of New York City Pride marches to animate a timeline of significant moments in national and New York LGBTQ history. Um, we are putting all this together with a mix of our own collections and loans from a lot of different uh, New York cultural institutions. Um, something that I want to bring up because you were wondering about students is that we actually uh, got funding from the Keith Herring Fund for Youth Audiences. So we are able to partner with community-based organizations in the five boroughs to provide free museum visits for disadvantaged city teens. So in addition to being grateful for your ongoing support, we wanted to ask for uh, your feedback in terms of suggestions for community organizations that might be able to send their kids over for free. Um, 
I think that's that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. and um, yes, um, love when you walk into the uh, New York Historical Society, you look up at the, at the ceiling the of the, uh, where you buy your ticket to come in and you have the Keith Herring um, work right there on that ceiling, which is great. Welcoming everyone who comes. Yes, yes, and, um, and, and I know that you do a lot of outwork with the teachers, but I do wanna say we've got you beat in Queens because we have a whole tennis center and stadium named after Billie Jean King, so. <laughs> And you have the highway. <laughs> She's a top lesbian. She's a top lesbian. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Say that again on the mic, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful picture of my colleague, Danny Drum, in the book. I knew a few. I was so young. <laughs> Thank you to the panel. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I believe this is our last panel. Hamza Din, representing Assemblyman Brian Barnwell. Is he here? Suzanne Rose, Richard, what, I can't, Wentherin, Todd Parker, and one more. Jordan Reeves. State your name and give your testimony. First. Wow. Hello, everyone. Glad you all stuck around. Uh, thank you all for having us here. My name is Jordan Reeves, founder of Video Out, and I'd like to do something very quickly, a little unconventional. So I want some audience participation. Is that okay? Um, if you're queer, stand up. Awesome. Now look at these people, right? Look at all of us. I should be standing too, I'm really queer. <laughs> they are, they're, they're real people. They have experiences much like your own. They have joys and triumphs. They have sorrows and disappointments. Um, and they're also queer. So they're just like the rest of us. You can be seated. I did that because it's kind of uncomfortable to be asked to display something fundamental about your identity. But that's really what coming out is. That's the process in which each queer person does in their lifetime, whether it's coming out to themselves, coming out to others. Um, and it's also something when you're asked to come out, when that's an expectation, um, it's in an alternate universe, something that could be used against you. I think that that's why people struggle with that moment coming out. Do I want to do it? Do I not want to do it? God, my parents are going to kill me. I'm going to kill myself. All of the, these things go through your head. Uh, but what we know about coming out now is actually the total opposite of all of that stuff. Um, so I'm also, I, I was going to be really articulate, but I'm trying to stick to that three minutes. So I'm trimming down here. Not very good at editing. I'm stereotypically loquacious. Uh, so the opposite is true. We base all of our work on three psychological principles. They're in my written testimony. Briefly, they are by Gordon Allport, Jeremiah Gerritsen, and Daniel Della Pasta. 
And basically, those psychological principles say that coming out can change the way people perceive the community. We've also traced, as recently as last year, how coming out can even um, shift the way people vote on specific LGBTQ protections. So just by coming out, you change the way people vote. Um, let's see. So video out's mission is to amplify the voices of LGBTQ people. We've traveled around the country, and so far we've collected hundreds of stories, produced dozens of events, and reached about five million people worldwide. In May, we're partnering with the center to do our first of five events to celebrate Stonewall 50. It'll be a story, uh, story collection day. There'll be two days where we have two cameras going at all times for anyone to sign up to share their personal story. Um, shortly after that, we're doing an event called Speak Out where we pick uh, four to six people to share their story in front of a live audience. Um, there's also a community activation component to that event where people can come and mingle, get to know one another, um, and then we'll be doing that event again on June 27th in partnership with the Brooklyn Brewery. Um, so if you like beer and you like stories, come out on June 27th. I'll be there. I'll end with a quick story. So I'm from Huey, very, very quick story. I'm from Hueytown, Alabama. Anybody ever been? No. You've heard of it though, I'm sure. It's a bustling metropolis of hundreds of people. So growing up in Hueytown, it wasn't a very nice place to be as a gay person. Um, everybody was really nice, but not nice to queers. So I cried myself to sleep every night. Um, I contemplated suicide. And what saved me was a story. I heard at 23 years old, my college professor sharing his own experience coming out. That gave me the courage to then share my own and to encourage others to do the same. So if the power of one story can save my life, what's the power of hundreds or thousands of stories to save others? So to get involved, visit videoout.org. Email me, jordan at videoout.org. Can't wait to see you. And in the words of Harvey Milk, you must come out. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. My name is Todd Porter. I'm the general manager for the Queer Urban Orchestra. The Queer Urban Orchestra, or Quo, is a flourishing community based ensemble with a loyal following. This year, which coincides with the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, also marks our 10th anniversary as New York's only symphony orchestra serving the needs of the LGBTQIA community. These anniversaries have spe uh, special resonance, for they come at a historical moment when authoritarian governments around the world are threatening to turn back the clock and undo the steady advances of the gay liberation movement. For this occasion, Quo is planning its annual gala concert at our home, the Church of the Holy Apostles in Chelsea, on June 21st at 8 p.m. Quo is inviting queer musicians from around the United States and abroad to be part of this concert benefiting our orchestra. The first combined rehearsal will be on June 19th with another on June 20th, followed by a get acquainted party welcoming the visiting musicians. The gala, which marks the end of our 2018-2019 Queer We Are season, will feature cabaret star Molly Pope as host and include music from Bernstein's West Side Story and Gershwin's An American Paris. We want to underscore the importance of this event for Quo and for the LGBTQIA musical community at large. There's no better vehicle than music to strengthen the, uh, the bonds amongst communities that are still fighting for acceptance and the most basic human rights. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Morelli, council members. My name is Suzanne Rose, and I'm a producer at WNET. And as you know, WNET is the parent company of 13, WLIW21, operator of NJTV, and we reach about uh, more than five million viewers each week. And um, as part of our mission to support lifelong learning, and in recognition of the historical significance of Stonewall, we are planning a range of programming to commemorate the, the anniversary. Um, but I am a producer in the education department, so that's what I would like to share about. Um, as you know, WNET has a strong partnership with the council, and through the council's generous support, we've created a suite of professional development and curriculum digital media resources. Uh, these feature videos, 
essays, discussion questions, teaching tips, and other support materials. Um, the collection is called the LGBTQ Plus Identity Collection. And this collection, in, uh, along with in-person professional development workshops, um, supports an LGBTQ inclusive and affirming curriculum in New York City schools and beyond. Um, and a key component of the collection is a video program on the history of Stonewall and its pivotal role in sparking the modern LGBTQ rights movement. So leading up to the anniversary, we'll promote the collection and our on-air programming on air, online, and through social media. And in partnership with the New York City DOE, um, we'll provide face-to-face -face workshops, um, professional development workshops to introduce teachers, guidance counselors, administrators to the collection. Um, we plan to reach 100 plus educators across the city and of course they'll take the information back to their schools and share it with educators and students. Um, this collection is available for free on PBS Learning Media and that is a website that reaches 1.8 million educators across the country, uh, 69,000 in New York State. The collection has page views of 20,000 to date, so it's being used in New York City schools across um, the city and, and nationwide. Um, so we look forward to continuing our strong partnership with the New York City Council, and we working with each council member to expand our collection so that we can reach even more educators. And just to bring some of the voices of educators into the classroom, I just want to share some of the feedback that we've received. Um, one educator, uh, I'll just say, the project is amazing and I'm so excited to continue using it in my classroom. I learned how to be more aware of the vocabulary to use with my LGBTQ students. I love the training, I want to do more. Um, and on and on, and this one. Students in my school would like teachers to know more about the concepts of spectrums relating to gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Perhaps most importantly, they want their teachers to be adept at quickly dealing quickly with and effectively with homophobic, transphobic, and any anti-LGBTQ behavior. So thank you so much for uh, letting me share today, and we wish, uh, we. We wish Chair Bramer a speedy recovery, so thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Richard Wenthin, and I'm a graduate social work intern at AARP New York. On behalf of AARP's nearly 38 million members nationwide, almost 900,000 of whom self-identify as LGBT, as well as our 800,000 members in New York City, I thank you for the opportunity to share our views and intentions for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall and World Pride 2019. Um, New York City's population is aging. Nearly one-third of residents is over the age of 50, and that group is expected to grow by nearly 20% between 2010 and 2040. The growth for the 65 plus age group is projected to be even more dramatic, with an expected 40% increase in that same time period. We know from our recent report, maintaining dignity, understanding and responding to the challenges facing older LGBT Americans, that LGBT people age 45 and older have concerns specific to their sexual and gender identities. 34% are concerned they may need to hide their identities to have access to suitable housing. About 40% are concerned their LGBT identities will affect the quality of health care they receive, compounded with racial discrimination for those with intersectional identities. 50% of older LGBT adults are only somewhat optimistic that the problem problems they face today will be rectified in the next 20 to 30 years. You can access the full research report as well as see all that AARP is doing for the LGBT community at aarp.org slash pride. Um, but all of this is to say that there is work to be done to safeguard the LGBT community against continued discrimination, and a large part of addressing stigmatization is with visibility through comprehensive social support. In 2019, AERP is committed to participating in World Pride and Stonewall 50 while partnering with LGBT organizations here in New York City. Uh, we are also a proud member of the uh, Stonewall 50 Consortium. Uh, we are eager to build new relationships and produce meaningful programming during this pivotal year, and we are hopeful that the city of New York will continue to support us all in this endeavor. 
Um, AARP is also dedicated to ensuring that Pride celebrations are accessible to people of all ages. Um, we supported SAGE in its creation of the Welcome to Pride Initiative and Age-Friendly Pride Pledge, achieved in partnership with Centerlink, Heritage of Pride, Interpride, and the Center for Black Equity. This is a useful tool for ensuring that the physical spaces, forms of communication, transportation, and civic and social participation are enacted in ways that are accessible, inclusive, and respectful of older LGBT folks. We ask that the City of New York and organizations participating in World Pride this year be mindful of ways Pride can be welcoming to people across the age spectrum. And what we do here can and will affect the national discourse and perception of how to best support the LGBT community. We have tremendous opportunity and responsibility in this historic year to lead by example and elevate the greater social understanding of our community. For AERP, Stonewall 50 and World Pride NYC mean the development of important partnerships and programs we can potentially bring nationwide by engaging in this city's rich LGBT culture. We are very thankful to the New York City Council and this committee for your ongoing support and we look forward to building an age-friendly and successful World Pride together. Thank Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Hamza Din and I'm a recently hired constituent liaison with Assemblyman Brian Barnwell. Brian wishes he was here poor personally, but he is unfortunately in Albany. I'm happy to be here, here at this event. That is, is, is a special event that has honored the anniversary of the Stonewall, which is a historic event in our nation's history. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, and please extend our um, thanks to uh, Assemblyman Bornwell as well. He's my neighboring, um, and a little bit of his district is in my district also. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists who have come in. Um, I particularly want to say thank you to WNET for the advertising that you're putting on in between, I don't know if you'd call it advertising, I call it advertising, in between programs to inform the public about the availability of the resources. Three or four times now when I've been watching WNET, and particularly on Saturday morning, which I think is important because you get a lot of students, I think, watching WNET at that time, up pops the ad about the resources that are available online. And I really encourage you to continue to do that so that it, it's, it's made more accessible and more people will know about that because the curriculum is excellent as well. So thank you for that. And equally so for AARP. I've noticed the ads um, and the rainbow flag in the ads and uh, the same-sex couples in the ads. So uh, that is a big step forward. And I was trying to do the math on your membership, 38 million members and 900,000. What percentage is that? Ooh, I know. God, it's, it's a, a question I was 3.8 would be 10%. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's relatively new data. We just collected that self. Uh, we don't ask upon um, registration for any self-identifying gender or orientation. Well, probably sex information, but not gender identity or um, sexual orientation. So this is relatively new data um, that we're trying to start to implement more successfully um, in meaningful programming. And using this year really as kind of a launching point uh, nationally, as well as, of course, here in New York City, where this will all be going on. So I think it's smart business, actually, because I think if you have um, 900,000 willing to identify now, and you're talking about my generation and older, where there's a lot more hesitancy to be open about this sexuality, I think you're going to see those numbers increase more and more as time goes on. Hopefully. So thank you for that also. And I do want to thank uh, Chair Koslowitz for chairing this meeting. We call her the cause, and she's wonderful. She, yes, she's been a huge supporter of the LGBT community, and uh, we love her very, very much. And I want to just extend my best wishes to Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer as well. The very same here. Tell them to get better quickly. Thank you very, very much. This is really, this hearing was very, very informative and I thank you very, very much to everyone that testified today. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> oh, you got that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Three points. Go up.